safari. We are coming to you from the Maasai Mara of Kenya and we got some animals there waiting to cross the Mara River. My name is David. Welcome aboard to your very own safari live from the African bush. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we got loads of uh, animals on the other side of the bank of the river. We got some topis there, and we also got some, some zebras. And behind them, we got some wildebeest in the background. And what we're trying to wait for here is to see if they are coming to cross this river. This is the Mara River. And one more time, Jumbo, everyone. My name is David and on camera with me this morning is Bungay. This is a very special uh, show for you of Digital Safari and we're just crossing fingers in this very cold morning, the Maasai Mara, that these animals are going to cross. It's about 17 degrees Celsius or 63 degrees Fahrenheit. And remember, we like to talk to you or we like you talking to us. And you can do that by tweeting to us using hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. For children, you can also do the same by sending us questions on email, kidsquestions at worldearth.tv. This is what these animals keep doing, moving from one end of the river to the other end from where I am. But at one point, I'm crossing fingers, they're coming to cross or they'll cross and maybe that crocodile will not get any one of them or if it's lucky, it's going to have some breakfast. It's a huge reptile, you can see there and you can see the drag mark as he came out out of the river and he's just warming him or herself right there. So we're going to spend some time here and hopefully these animals are going to cross this river. Stay tuned. Good morning everyone and welcome to and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. My name is Grant and behind the camera this morning we have Craig. Craig and I are going to be heading to where we left that lioness with the three young males uh, to see because they, their tummies looked relatively empty so we're hoping that something uh, happened there last night going through the open grasslands the area where we have been spending a lot of time <clears throat> we've still got a little bit of a way to go uh, so along our way to where they last were we're going to be looking out for cheetah um, we've already seen some more buffaloes. There's always good birds of prey in this area and... Off. So when we get to the top of this hill we'll... We'll stop. We'll just spend a, a few minutes with these giraffes and uh, and then we'll c continue on our lion search. It's very good to see giraffes in the morning, but apparently I do not think giraffes may do what these animals will do. When you see giraffes crossing this river, you'll get one or two giraffes very slowly crossing the river and they got the advantage of the height. Now, these animals here have picked pace, as you can see, and earlier we had the toppies in front and a few uh, numbers of wildebeest, of uh, zebras, but now look at the lead group. It's like 90% the wildebeest. Very determined, maybe to cross the river. Let's just watch and see what they're going to do. 
In the background, hopefully you can hear the rapids of the Mara River. I'm not sure this is the same herd I've seen here a couple of days coming so close to the river and failing to cross. Sometimes they get inside the water, have a drink, move in a few meters, then just go back. Marcel, it's very difficult to know if there's a leader in these particular herds. I think it's the one that picks the carriage first and determines to cruise and like, you know, guys, let's do it. But we cannot say there's any particular wildebeest that is in charge of the herd. I do not think so. I may not be 100% sure, but I do not think there's a particular leader uh, that determines when and where and how to cross the river. Marcel, out of experience, would have seen if the pressure builds from the back, the ones in the front are left with not much choice but just to plunge their bodies inside the river and cross. I'm looking at that scenario today. So patience here is always very key, and that's exactly what I'm going to do uh, for the next couple of hours. A very good morning and welcome to the side of the Mara. I'm in the Mara Triangle and I am Isaac and on camera I have Big James and we are located in the Mara Triangle in the Masai Mara. Just talking about a leader, we have elephants here and elephants usually have a leader and she's called the matriarch. Unlike the wildebeest that usually um, a leader just springs out here, the oldest, the most experienced female is called the matriarch and she is the leader of the herd. She, she carries all the memory and so she's able to make decisions. Remember, this is your life safari coming from the Masai Mara and this female here, I call her, call her crooked and I have seen her many, many years and it's always nice to see her. I think she is the matriarch of this herd. Talking about leaders, in elephants, they do need one because they live very long, they need to remember lots of things. They, whatever her knowledge she's got, she passes it on from one female to the other, all the way to the calves. And you can see that every time when there's some a decision to be made, like a river crossing, walking through a dangerous area, maybe, maybe a cornfield or a human habitated area, she is the one to make a call. When there is danger, she also makes call where everybody gathers around to protect the, real, the little ones. Remember, this is uh, the African elephant. It is my first animal of the day, and I hope the, my things are going to be elephants. I hope my things are going to be big. It's going to be an exciting day. Uh, it's a very cool weather. Yvesh, you ask if they eat insects while feeding on grass. Of course, they do, I'm sure. And I think the insects do get a shock of their life when they find themselves inside the grass and inside the tummy of the elephants. They have no chance but to die. I don't think it can affect the elephant in any way because that is a big animal. You need a lot of, like bacteria to affect the elephant because that might be the next question if it would affect the elephant but i'm sure they do eat um you know things like grasshoppers even sometimes frogs even small mice uh, bad eggs um they sometimes do pick them up uh, i'm sure they do because they don't choose the grass they just pick it even spiders i think small ones i'm, I'm sure they do pick them up uh it could be um I could be lying to say no because imagine living for 65 years and eating grass or brush and not eating a fly or an insect that would be very very lucky so uh, i think they do eat um, insects where they are is very close to the marsh and so i think 
if the sun comes up because it looks very overcast this morning they will be at the marsh where it's cool it's nice there is water and the grass is soft like spaghetti good morning and welcome to and beyond gala where this morning we are basically looking for anything that we can find we're looking for some signs on the roads and myself i'm yapi behind the camera we have Gert. and um, after the rains we have dragged the road so now it will be easier to see some of the finer tracks on these roads i heard already this morning some of the trackers are off on tracks of a female leopard with a youngster and hopefully they'll have some luck at this point we're giving them a hand but we're not specifically looking for the leopard i think we'll take a little drive down to some big clearings and see if we might find something else now with the conditions like this after the rain it was still a cool evening and this morning there's a lot of dew on the ground so if there were any tracks that were made during the night it would be very difficult to get an extremely good idea of exactly when they were made and with the tracking part it takes years for somebody to be able to really know exactly how to age the tracks so in a way i guess we're going on a hunch Now the areas that we are at, these are technically the floodplains along the riverbed and the grasses and the trees in this area are the more sought after for the grazing and the browsing animals. The plains here could be rather different and more open. And if you look carefully, you'll get sometimes all these herds spread out in the savanna. The group just stopped at the very edge of the river. And if you look closely, they're hard handling together. And not sure for what reason, not sure they're trying to build the courage on each other and saying, you know, guys, we can do it. It's not hard, it's not difficult. We need maybe a few more coming in, and then all of us uh, go in together. I've always wondered if the rapids in the water affect them with their, their crossing. And what happens, we have a few other crossing points on or along the Mara River, and this is just one of those crossing points that I personally prefer because with luck we always see them crossing. but. The story of these animals huddling together by the banks of the river is a good one to watch. Every year, the red oat grass plains of the Masai Mara sway with anticipation. About two million grazers are about to arrive to feast on nature's bounty. They come in search of food and water, all the way from the southern plains of the Serengeti in Tanzania. Hundreds and thousands of wildebeest, zebra, and gazelles follow the cracking African thunderstorms. The greening pastures and the rolling rivers. Zebras are the vanguard eating the longer grass and exposing the shorter shoots for the wildebeest behind. But all must face the ultimate migration challenge, the Mara River. Beneath the surface lurks nature's favorite villain. With reptilian patients, they've waited nine months for the migration feast. The herd sense the danger, 
but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge, but not all will make it. For those that do, Hungry predators line the banks on the other side. Survivors will feast on the tall grasses, crossing again and again, following the storms for nourishment. certainly do bring a lot of joy to the bush for all animals and here I have a little gift he is very very well hidden but he looks great hopefully he'll show himself a little clearer as we sit here but it is a Tingana everyone Tingana is back on Juma it's been weeks since we've seen him And he looks great. Haven't seen if he's scent marking. Didn't hear him sawing. So we're not really sure if whether he's still claiming this area as his territory. But the mere fact that he's here tells us that he feels strong. And he feels uh, very able to be here in Juma without feeling too much of a threat. Latingana has been our dominant male left here for a long, long time. He's estimated to be born in 2006. That was when he was first seen. We don't really know his parents. And he has been a firm favorite of us here. Always enjoy seeing him. Such a character. Such a large leopard. We've been seeing a lot of the females. It's been a while since we had Tingana. A really beautiful big male leopard. Well, I hope we see him scent mark and things like that. <laughs> Mello, you say the legend is back. Absolutely. The mist on Juma was for no other reason than to enrobe the legend as he makes his way back to his home, or rather his kingdom. Oh, look at that eye. I am so, so happy, so happy. Sightings of Tingana are few and far between now. The other male leopard that we have on the property, Mowati, he is quite shy of vehicles, which is ironic because Tingana's name means shy. But Mawati, we don't get very many sightings with him. So to see a lovely male leopard is just awesome. Riley, you'd like to know how big his territory is? In Kilometer Squared, I don't know. Um, but what I do know is that it extends basically between Juma, it used to be actually the entirety of Juma, up north into Bifosuk where he spends the majority of his time. And we've even seen him as far west as Arathusa. And even into Torchwood. But that was at a time when 
his territory was quite expansive. Actually, the time we saw him in Arethusa, which was on extreme west, that time was around the same time where he started to spend a lot more time north. So it's almost as if he began to wander just a little bit more. But when he first, when sightings with him first became irregular, he used to be spending a lot of time up in Bafulsuk. So his territory is quite large. It will encompass a few females' territories. At the moment, it theoretically encompasses Tandis, and it encompasses uh, Shudulus, Lalambas, as well as Luna up in the north, possibly even Kuchava. But with the introduction of Malwati, who's basically most of the time we see him in the southern section of Juma, it's excluded a few of those females from Tingana. some movement. I'd love to get just one clear shot of him so you can see just how, what a marvelous leopard he is before we have to move out of the sighting. I've seen that he doesn't particularly like getting wet and on all the mist there'd be a lot of dew on the grass. I've seen it rain on him before when he just rolled his eyes and stared up at the heavens and gave it quite a skull, which I thought was very cute. So now he's found himself a cozy little spot. Hopefully he can stay dry. And welcome back to Ngala, where it looks like we found a dark chanting goshawk. And the bird's sitting high up in what looks to be a marula tree. You can see the head's turning in all different directions from there. He's got an excellent view of this area. And where he is, that tree is right up on the bank of the riverbed. Now, at the moment, these clearings around the banks of the river with the taller grasses have been a area of congregation for large amounts of doves, especially laughing doves. And we've noticed quite a lot of birds of prey have been coming this way to come and see if they might get lucky with one of those doves. I can see there's a little bit, there's a little small bird on the lower right hand side and that looks like a fork-tailed dronco. so does this goshawk migrate? No, this goshawk does not migrate. Um, this goshawk is around for most of the year. The perch that we see is quite a high perch as well and that is a very good spot to do its territorial call. I imagine you were able to sit that up high this morning. I think that would have been quite spectacular to see the clearings on the other side of the riverbed. You can 
can see there's some clearings leading up to that edges. So that's the right along the brim of the riverbed. You get the taller trees, and then there's some shrubland below, and then these beautiful grass clearings nearby. Now normally, when there's a little bit more water in this area, and when it's warmer, we do see quite a few wildebeest, sometimes even rhino and giraffe in these parts. Nadella, that's actually exactly what I'm waiting to see, is will the Drongo um, dive bomb this goshawk? Now, I know that that Drongo is there to make the goshawk's life slightly more difficult, and I guess um, it's better to keep an eye on something that has a potential danger. But I think, oh, there we go. Oh, I wonder where it's heading to. All right, well, you can hear the birds calling there in the distance. That's a gray go-away bird. And that's more than likely because they saw that um, goshawk flying off. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to continue along. And then we will try and see if we might pick up on further tracks. We had leopard tracks back on this road, not too far from where we are. Those tracks were from early morning. Um, JP, what different methods do you use to track animals? That is an extremely uh, good question because there are so many different ways to track animals. Number one, we know certain animals specifically. We know that they have um, specific areas that they head to. They have specific um, air, habits. They go to specific watering holes. So it does a little bit depend on knowing the animal's behavior themselves and the individual animals, but it is also something that um, we need to keep in mind is that there's the aging of tracks, there's the finding of tracks, so physically and systematically tracking those signs that they leave by their paw prints on the ground or the markings that they leave behind when they actually spray urine on a tree or when they scratch a tree. In other animals, that's territorial. We know that they have these specific spots that they go to. They lay down in the evening. They might spend a lot of time there. Um, then we also listen out for sounds, like any alarm sounds. Predators are usually a threat to smaller creatures. Those creatures often make a lot of noise when there's a predator nearby. Um, for instance, the impala, when it sees something like a leopard, it might call constantly. It might make a noise and keep its eye on that leopard. So if we drive in, we find the impala, then at least we got a good indication of where the predator might be. But then you have other animals that's a little bit more reliable, like the kudu, for instance, or the bushbuck. If they see something, there's a good chance that they might actually see a predator as large as a leopard. Where with impala, they have been known to see or call at a lot of different things moving. Sometimes when they're not sure, even when they see ourselves mo moving through the bush, then they might even alarm at that. Welcome back to Ambion Pinde, everyone. And look what we've found. So we came back to the area where that lioness with the three youngsters uh, were yesterday afternoon and not too far away we just spotted the one of the male lions and his brother is also here and the mom with the three sub-adults are also all here so there's a little bit of a pride of lions with us at the moment and 
Craig will give you a look at all of the lions now. There's one of the big males rolling in some buffalo dung um, just up ahead of us. Oh, and he's just stood up. <laughs> so this is where that herd of buffaloes we were with yesterday, um, they were here as well. And so he's just found some pretty fresh dung and he was rolling in that dung. And he's now scent marking, he's spraying urine onto that tree behind him. I wonder if he's going to go for a drink of water. Or maybe straight to his brother, give his brother some, some affection. It's, these are the two lions that were feeding on a giraffe carcass uh, yesterday and the day before. We, oh, there comes one of the young males. Gonna give him a fright. into this gap. Oops. heading towards his brother. See what happens here, he might give his brother a head nudge. There we go. Hello, hello, um, whoa, um, good morning, welcome back, um, we have some hippos over here, and surprisingly, they're out of water, it's unusual to find them this far out, I don't know if it's my voice, but all of a sudden, they have changed their behavior, yeah, but the weather is perfect, it's cool, so they are allowed to be out. Looks like it's um, two males and they're off towards the water. The river is not very far but it's a very steep drop down. I don't know if we'll be able to see that. I'm going to try and position as soon as they disappear onto that drop there. They're heading into the water. This is a very big animal and it's supposed to be in the water this time of day and they have gone. Let me see if I'm gonna position and we can see them going into the water. Yeah.
Yeah, they're somewhere here. Um, we might, I don't know if we'll be able to see them. There they go. It's a quite a big drop. I don't know if we'll be able to see them, but uh, over there, right at the edge of the corner, you'll see them. Yeah, you see them. Yeah. Yeah, into the water where they're supposed to be for the rest of the day. Yes. And they're very good swimmers and they're heavy, so they cannot be washed downstream. They can stay underwater for very long. Hey, we have a crocodile. And looks like he's swimming upstream. Raphael, you're asking how often they leave water to go graze. Uh, it's uh, once a day. They leave in the evening and then come back in the morning. Yeah, and, and um, they spend the whole night out. So basically they leave uh, once every evening, spend the whole night out, coming back very early in the morning. They are actually mostly nocturnal. That's what you'd call them. They'd graze at night and they can go up to around three miles out of water in search of their favorite food, grass. In one night, they'll consume up to around 30 to 40 kilograms of grass. Don't ask me how much water they drink because they're already in the water they can drink whenever they want. That is the Nile crocodile. And he's in a, you know, an, an area where I don't know what he eats because it's very far from the crossings. And at the same time, not very many animals come here to drink because it's a very steep bank. But maybe he's just um, on transit. He's going somewhere and uh, maybe that's where he's headed. Um, that's why he's made a stopover. You can tell that he's right behind that little stumpy a tree in the water and maybe the current is not as strong that's very smart i would say you know um definitely that's what he's doing he's staying right behind that little stump in the water and so the current is not as strong and maybe you know he was resting and then he's going to continue yeah basically i think that's what that's what's happening that's a nile crocodile these are predators they're carnivores it's one of the only few predators that still considers man as a source of food here in the wild they rarely take people but they are known to take people where you know people go to swim people to collect water they do take people and these guys this time of the year they're having a feast because there is plenty to eat the zebra will be stoppy it's such a big menu for them you know you just wish you want to be a crocodile this time of the year because there's more than enough for everybody but after eating they can stay for a very very long time without eating up to one year another thing that makes me like them you know i would like to stay that long after eating and just rest and do nothing but um there's something about being human also it's it's nice so i'll leave the crocodile to be eat and eat once a year this is an animal, this is a reptile that can stay underwater for up to one hour. Can you imagine? One hour. So you have no chance when you get into this water and it drags you down. It, it has been known to kill almost everything. Uh, is that Jet, Jetro? How fast can a crocodile swim? Um, no, I don't know. That one, you got me, I don't know. Uh, I'll do some research. But um, I must tell you, they're much faster than the fastest swimmer we have uh, in the world. They are very, very fast. So actually they're fast, but I don't know how fast they swim. And you know, although we see one here, this river is infested with these guys. They estimate that every 20 square meters there is a crocodile. Believe me, over here there might not be many, you don't see any, but I tell you, some areas where we go you will see that that can be true. Over here the river is so quiet, it's so calm, it must be very very deep. 
you see there's a sharp bend way up there that's how the river meanders if you fly over this river it's so stunning so beautiful it just bends and bends and bends that is a beautiful sight look at that thank you james you can tell the force of water around that corner is just incredible yeah look at that you just want to go canoeing but it is not the kind of place to do that they once tried to do canoeing in this river but before they put life people they put a dinky with uh, minikins and there's a sequence of pictures of a hippo seeing the minikin and it's lifting its head running towards the dinky grabbing it and drowned it and that was the end of the idea of having you know crafting in this river so it's only meant for crocodiles and hippo and I think the main reason it's uh, very narrow. If it was wide, you'd maneuver around hippos and crocodiles, but it's uh, very narrow. You cannot do anything. Remember, I'm talking about uh, the Mara River, a beautiful river that cuts through the Masai Mara Game Reserve. Yeah, I'm gonna watch this guy because He's rather smart, he's resting. Or maybe he's on top of that log. Maybe that log stretches towards, towards where he is and he's lying on top of it, resting before deciding to continue. Well, not sure whether that crocodile where Isaac is, is enjoying any rapids like I am here with this uh, wild beast, and true Mara River is one of the most beautiful rivers just to see how it meanders through the Masi Mara Game Reserve and the Serengeti National Park. Well, I've re remained, I have just repositioned now because these animals moved to a different area and I followed them, and this is where they have brought me. Now again, look, the lead has changed. We've got some zebras, but the wildebeest are saying we know better and we're moving fast. They'll be the head of the crossing group. Keep moving, keep moving toward the toppies. And the area they're going into to me is much trickier to cross the river from where they're coming from. How they choose where they are going to cross even today, it boggles my mind because certain locations have very sharp gradient, full of big rocks. And when they jump in the water, we have seen them, or we have seen many of them die from the fractures they get on their legs. Sometimes they just you choose to cross where we've got so many crocs. And the moment they choose to do that, they do not stop. Even when they see sometimes one or some of them are getting brought down by the reptiles in the water. I guess one of the best crossings I'll ever watch is to see the three different species cross together. I'm talking of toppies, zebras and the wildebeest. But somehow toppies will always cross on their own. But the wildebeest and the zebras tend to mix up sometimes when they're doing the same. Come on guys, stop looking at the water. Go for it, you can do it. But definitely they know the dangers in the Mara River. And when Isaac was talking of canoeing, or kayaking in this river, I would imagine meeting the hippos or crocs, how dangerous that could be. I believe if this river wasn't in a conservation area, like the Masimara or Serengeti, I would believe so many people would be having fun with their small little boats and assuming there are no hippos or crocs. I'll continue monitoring the movement of these animals and maybe bring you a surprise much later. Welcome back to Ambion Pinde, everyone. 
these three young males are quite lively. They're wrestling over some stick. Entertaining themselves with some mud. I think he's got a rock. The two males and the lioness have left us. So we'll definitely go and have a look for them. But for now, while these youngsters are up and about and playing, we're going to spend some time watching them. It looks like that one's got a rock and he didn't want to share it with his brother. Yeah, it's literally a rock. <laughs> moved far at all from where we left them last night so I assume keeping the when it first started to get light this morning they would have woken up and had all this energy from sleeping the whole night so they got lots of energy to burn to play. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. But uh, we are here with uh, Tingana. He is at least sat up just a little bit. And in order to bring you these wonderful live creatures, it comes with its own difficulties. But it's been a cats today. I'm so glad that Tingana is here. Of course, there's a perfectly placed stick just in front of his eye. And Oh, the Duke is now falling asleep. I think that speaks a lot to his comfort at the moment. If he was uncomfortable here in Juma, if he felt totally threatened, for one, he wouldn't be here. And secondly, he would not feel so comfortable. He looks very relaxed and very, very comfortable. He's moving around in some really dense grass. It's going to be quite difficult for us to get a really good view of him. But after spending quite some time with all of the lepidesis we have in, the, in this area, seeing Tingan after such a long time really emphasizes his size. enjoy that. You'll be able to hear a white brown scrub robin. There's some blue wax bulls. You'll hear some of the horn bulls. Just enjoy the morning sounds and the sunlight as Tingana is. we'll be able to stick with him just for a little longer until other vehicles arrive and hopefully he'll stop fast so we can get a good view of his beautiful face. All right, welcome back and it's always to see the leopards you know in that kind of um, area where the camouflage really works. Well, finally, what? Finally, what we have been waiting for is happening. And sorry, we had to take you away very quickly from the elephants because I've been here for the last couple of days waiting for this very spectacle to happen. 
The migration is very big in the Masuimara Serengeti ecosystem, but the highlight is these animals crossing the Mara River. Just watch. It's happening right now, live on this digital safari, courtesy of CGTN. I'm full of joy that finally my weight has paid. Now I'm imagining the struggle they're going through because of the rocks in there, the nervousness in all these animals, knowing we got loads of crocodiles right there. How exciting is this? If you look carefully, there's a crocodile on the other end. It's slowly coming towards the wildebeest. Just watch. It's like a log. It's floating in the water. That's the crocodile. And definitely is going to catch maybe one of these wildebeest. Two of them now. Look carefully. Coming towards the wildebeest. The area is quite deep, number one. But above all, there are too many rocks where they're crossing. I told you it's always a very difficult decision and when they choose to cross, where they choose to cross, it could be very tricky as it is now. Good luck to all those who will make it. The zebras will also be joining them very soon. And I'm not sure those crocs have caught something. Look at that baby, they're close to a screen. There's one baby that's being drifted away from the rest. Two of them, and one of them definitely has been brought down by a crocodile. You see the crocodile there is pushing one towards the edge of the river. And it definitely has caught one. This is the downside of these animals when they choose to cross in a location that's not very safe. For those of you who could be sensitive, this is Mother Nature, and it's the cycle of life. And remember, we came coming to you live from the Maasai Mara Game Reserve of Kenya. And some maybe are seeing the dangers in the water and maybe may choose to go back to where they came from. See the challenges they're going through, that even reversing is a problem. You can hear some are just struggling there and just calling for help. Yeah, that croc must have gotten two calves there. Right there, if you look carefully, there's a croc trying to drown. <laughs> I, I wonder if you just if you just caught me talking about how beautiful Tingana's shoulder blades were. I was actually singing about it. Tingana and his beautiful shoulder blades and telling Theo if you want to see shoulder blades. This is the one you want to look like, look at. Well, sorry about the Mara guys, but again, we're lucky to have Tingana and we have a little bit of alone time before we have to leave. And we got a really nice view. So this is awesome. Really, really nice. Now oh, he's curling up in a bit of a ball, as he tends to do. And there's a nice patch of sun there too. So he's just enjoying himself. There's nothing I can tell you about Tingana except the fact that he's a legend. He is a large leopard, I would probably put him at about 90 kgs or so. If I was being conservative, between 80 and 90. He's a big leopard. Average male leopard, you're looking mm, about maybe 60 to 70. Females are more in the realm of the 40s. Kgs, those are. So he's, he's big. He's in charge. And, like I said, it's so nice to see him because 
We've just not been fortunate with sightings with him of late. Just gorgeous. Like So now, I, like I said, we have a little bit of time with him. And we may have to leave soon. I keep telling you that just in case when I do leave, you understand why. But I'll try and stay as long as possible. Well, Trishala, keep uh, the leopard. I'm keeping the crossing here. And they continue crossing and quite a spectacle to see them cross the river. This is the highlight of the migration. And remember... His body and stuff. Oh no, sorry guys. And yet again, you would have caught me talking about Tingana's shoulder blades. <laughs> I just find him so impressive. So, so impressive. Listen to the silence. You know, we're so used to hearing all the signs and signals, clues that the bush gives when there's a predator around. But here we have a large dominant male leopard curled up in a ball and do you hear a single clue? Nothing. Just absolute silence. I meant magic. You'd like to know what the average lifespan for a leopard did. Well, in captivity, they can actually live up to about 20 years old. But in the wild, we're looking at about 15 to 17. 17 would be really pushing it. And about 13, you can expect some sort of drop off in the kindest way possible. And anything beyond that is pretty good. The average would be between 15 and 17, but around 13, you're going to see some leopards depending on their condition. Also, move on from this life. Tingana is her 14. On, guys. I can hear your vehicle. You can make your way straight in. Okay. He's quite a bit off the road, so it's a bit difficult to get in. Anyway, we were talking about his age, and I still think that he's got a few good years left him. He's in fabulous condition. He looks great. I, I haven't seen his tummy to see if he's eaten recently. But his fur is in such good condition. His face looks like it's in great condition. We looked at his eyes. His eyes looked healthy. He didn't have a limp when he moved just the few meters that he did. So for me, he looks, he looks great. And I think he will continue to be healthy and strong for the remainder of his years, however long that may be. And welcome back to Ngala, where we've just picked up on very, very fresh tracks of a female leopard. Now, over there up on the bank, you can see there's sort of like a little bit of a pathway that's formed and it comes straight down here. Now it looks like it's been formed by elephants and there are some elephant tracks here sometime during the night and right on top these fresh, fresh tracks of a female leopard. Now the interesting thing is we had an impala 
just on the bank of the river behind us. We heard a couple of them alarming and then we found one with a huge gash on its hind right leg. And that, I think, was her attempting to try and hunt one. Now, the interesting thing is, we can see this is a female due to the size. Miso, how to tell if a track is fresh? That is a very, very tricky thing to do, unfortunately. Um, not a lot of people are very skilled at it, and it is something that also you learn over many, many years. For me personally, I'm still learning at this point how to tell that, but... Um Sorry about that, guys. Oh, just in time. A beautiful face of Tingana. Here that another vehicle has just joined us as well. It does mean that I am going to have to leave soon for reals once the other vehicle comes along. Look at that, look at that. He looks so healthy. Of course, you can see there's still scars, etc. on him. You can see his ears are still quite tattooed. But those are scars to tell the story. for most of the day so even if we do have to leave maybe we can come back a little bit later <laughs> he has quite magnificent eyes very large and wide He's a five five male, like his daughter, Clalamba, five five female. Tandi Clalamba's mother is a three three female. It's quite easy to tell them apart. Those, of course, meaning the spots above the whisker line. There's a black headed oriole calling in the background. Ooh. Very cool. Well, hopefully, he'll pick his head up one last time before we have to leave. Talking about a spectacular morning, um, to get back to Miso's question from earlier, how to tell if a track is fresh. Now, it is a tricky thing to do in certain cases, especially if the conditions um, aren't too favorable. Now, yesterday and the day before, yesterday morning we had some rain and the previous days we had rain. So that sometimes help us when animals move across the riverbed and they break the top layer of the soil and you can see the drier soil underneath and you know it's fresh but in this case it's a female leopard and it's a very small track but she is quite light on her feet so as she walked here she didn't break the top layer of the soil now what's interesting is it literally just made a small indentation on the ground now 
In this case, I was lucky. We had impalas alarming near this area, but up on the bank behind us. And we also know that there weren't any tracks crossing the riverbed in this particular area yesterday. So that is the biggest help for us in this case. But the other thing is with tracks, you look at how crisp the edges are of the track. In this case, it's very, very crisp. So crisp that in some senses, you can actually see the three indentations of the pad at the back, which is very, very clear. And you can see she's carefully moved, placing her back foot. This is her back left foot, slightly on top of the front left foot and then the next one so she was moving at a steady pace but relaxed and she probably saw as she came around she came down looked like that from that little pathway there at the back i'm sure she was busy patrolling after the range she needs to remark her territory moved up into the reed side saw some impala up on the bank and decided to use the reeds and the river bank the vegetation there to start stalking now, it should be interesting because she's injured that impala and it can barely walk at this stage. So I'm not sure if she's going to continue and try and stalk it again because it is a sitting duck and I'm pretty sure it won't make it. Um, but I think she came back down towards the riverbed side. I heard birds going in the riverbed earlier and that might be that she came to um, hide this side. Rivka, my favorite animal to track is definitely the leopard. The leopard is a tricky animal to track because it can be very unpredictable at certain points and because it moves by itself. Unlike the lion, it often moves in a group and the lion sometimes uses the, early, the easiest route to travel around in the area that they are. And when that happens, we are usually quite um, lucky to find the tracks on certain major game paths. Where the leopard, it moves along major routes that other animals do travel, but it's not always uh, specific in that sense. And whenever the leopard sees something, it might change its direction. So it's kind of like a up and down movement and it often doesn't even really take things like the wind or so on into consideration except when it's hunting. So I would definitely say leopard in that case. It's the most trickiest. Now this particular leopard in this area that we are, we know that there's only one female leopard moving here, one large female leopard that we see regularly and I'm sure that um, this is her moving here. Taylor made. <laughs> I don't know how close she is in this case. Um, the aim of a tracking session is usually to find the animal. So, in some cases, you try you try and avoid getting into their personal space. All you try and do is try and get an idea of where they are and hopefully get a view of this animal from the vehicle itself. But in this case, she's already passed. We heard the impalas alarming, and we saw that injured impala quite a while ago already. And I'm pretty sure that by now this animal has moved off further away from that area. As soon as she gets spotted, as soon as the animals know that she's there, then she will move off to regain her neutrality. But in this case, it's nice and open for me. I can see clearly there's no potential danger around. Mint magic. Interesting question. Do animals recognize other animals' tracks? I think they recognize other animals' scent and the, the scent trails that they leave, um, the smells that's left behind, like dung balls, for instance. We have elephant dung balls here. Now, sometimes an elephant dung ball can even have quite a scent for up to a day or longer, especially after the rains. But I don't think that... Um, they specifically know by looking at the tracks that it is a, a leopard or say an elephant or something like that. I think they do have to use their sense of smell in that case. They do recognize other animals very clearly and that's usually to do with the body language and the shape of the animal itself.
Kylo, a track in a spoor is, I guess, it's the same thing in a lot of ways. Um, we, some people call it spoor, some people call it tracks. Uh, in my own experience, I think it is the same thing. Like this technically is a spoor. A spoor, spoor is an Afrikaans word and it literally means track. So translated into English is track. And it refers not just to the physical imprint, like this particular footprint of the leopard. It also refers to any other signs they might leave. Signs of like other drag marks, um, scent signs, anything like that. So I think we're going to follow these tracks and see where they go. Well, yeah, it's always, or it pays to follow trucks because they might lead you to some interesting animals, like the cats. Well, sorry, at one point, I'm sure you lost me when you were seeing the oil bees and the zebras uh, crossing the river, but now we are back in business. And we had more than half of that group that was on the other side of the river crossing but unfortunately, uh, a few wildebeest have been lost, or rather, some of the crocs here have caught uh, some wildebeest. Now, this one has come out of the water, and I got a feeling she must have stashed something in the water, a dead uh, wildebeest. And now she knows whatever time she gets hungry, she'll come back to the water and feed. It was quite an intense moment to see all those animals struggling uh, to cross the river, which normally is the case. The fear of getting caught by these reptiles here is always their major or their main concern. So we'll be waiting to see whether another group will be coming here and maybe see another exciting moment. doing his territorial drumming. Celsius and 54 degrees Fahrenheit here in Juma. I think it's probably warmed out about warmed up about a degree. But the birds are still looking quite nice and fluffy. Isn't that a gorgeous bearded woodpecker? Now down below here. And there's also some impala, but I just want to see if it'll drum for us one more time. woodpecker that we get here. It's a really big beak. Mego, you'd like to know how the beak doesn't get damaged. It's got a very, very solid beak. So the beak is an extension of the maxilla facial bones, basically. So it's like almost an extension of the jaw. So if you imagine that if you had a beak, it would be attached to your jaw. In a similar way, the bones of that area, the maxilla bones, are all fused. And this is for all birds to create this beak. Now, their beak is solid, but it can get chipped. I have seen photos of woodpeckers with just the tip of the beak chipped. And that can happen. But because of the shock-absorbing qualities of the muscle that wraps around its skull, that cushions the impact even for the beak, not just for the brain. On a 
not don't like this is a really nice place for woodpeckers to be pecking about. That's because it's got a lot of dry bark. Can you see that now? I want to pick that bark off, off and lift it to get to those tasty grubs. Beetle larvae, a firm, firm favorite. Well, at least he drummed for us the one time to let us know who's boss. But now I'm going to move on and check up the hyena den. We are looking at a zebra with an identity crisis hanging out with a whole herd of impala. Oh, goodness gracious me, these impalas are getting a little frisky. There's a whole bunch of males and some females there, and uh, they just don't know what's going on this morning. Hi, I'm Mike, and behind the camera is Odie, and you've joined us here at Eco Training's Pride Lens Conservancy. Yeah, and we're just uh, around the area of Ndlovu Dam. Oh, I'm lying, not Ndlovu Dam, Leopard Dam. And we found some lion tracks and some leopard tracks, and we are just trying to uh, see what else is around here, and if we can come across those lion, or that lion which made those tracks, as you can see there's just a few impalas amongst the sticks doing their impala thing. Looking very nervous. I mean, if there were lions moving through here sometime this morning, it means that uh, they're probably a little bit on edge about the whole thing. They're very well camouflaged amongst these sticks and grasses, and our zebra seems to have wandered a bit further away now. They did not have an identity crisis. It's actually uh, just staying amongst the impalas because it means uh, better chance to spot danger. Oh, there's a, there's, an, there's a hyena calling. Maybe you just listen. It's very far. I don't think you'll be able to, to hear it. It's calling to our north, it sounds like, or northeast. It's very far, though, so it's probably outside of the boundaries of Pride Lands. But nonetheless, it's nice to hear. So yes, so what we're going to do is we're going to keep on driving down this road and just looking for any tracks and signs and see what uh, what else is about in these in these sides. Carlo, oh my goodness, the bush will change so much. We were actually talking about it uh, on the drive a bit earlier, Odie and I, and how quite a lot of the knob thorns are flowering and some of the trees are green, even though it's super dry everywhere else. And literally, as soon as those first rains come, which I suspect will be around September, end of September, October, it's going to just be an incredible green flash that just comes out. I think at Ingala, you're already starting to see it, maybe even at, uh, at Juma. We haven't really received much rain here. It's just been like some really, really miserable drizzle days, but nothing that really soaked the ground yet. As soon as it happens, we're just going to have an explosion, and we can't wait for it, because the flowers, the insects, the birds, oh, it's absolutely magnificent. We should actually take a photo of a, a point on the reserve that's quite barren right now at this time of year. Maybe this, maybe exactly where this impala is. Take a photo and then come back here in two months' time. The same photo. It will be unrecognizable. There'll be lush, thick green grass. Oh, there's, a, there's an impala that's resting now. Because it's a nice warm morning, animals won't move too far. and It's not windy at all. It's nice and calm. So they'll all be um, taking their time to feed as much as they can on whatever's left because they don't really have to worry too much about predators right now. Not with so many eyes and ears around and um, with such a fairly open area. It, looks, it doesn't look open. It looks like there's lots of sticks, but it is actually quite an open area um, for these impala. They can see very, very well. So you can see there, there's a few sickle bushes, but it's generally quite grassy over there. So as we, as we move around this area, we'll come to another very big open area called Red Earth, which actually I think in my mind's eye, I've got this image of a male lion sitting in the middle of that, of that clearing, also just enjoying the sun, which would be pretty cool. I can still hear that impala. It sounds like it's in the valley now. Oh, you know where it probably is, Norman? I reckon it's probably exactly there where, the, where that uh, rocky area was that we saw yesterday. Ooh, we wondered if maybe, maybe, maybe we've got a new hyena den. I will go check it out a bit later this morning. That'll be pretty awesome. 
It's really reverberating through the through the valley, the sound. Well, in the meantime, let's just enjoy this beautiful view. Hey, welcome back to the Mara and we have the landscape here. I've been driving on these plains, uh, hoping to find a kitty cat, but they are eluding me. I don't know if it's too chilly for them and that's why they are not out here. And, uh, but the elephants and the buffalo are out in numbers. They are all over that forest. In that picture we might not see them, but they are there. But I have the beautiful topi, an antelope that roams our plains and makes sure that it eats its, uh, its uh, you know, part of the grass. It is important for all these animals to be here because if they were not here, it would be overgrown with grass. This is what I call the wooded savanna. It's a mixture of shrubs and open grassland it looks like they are a bit more of topis. You can tell that they're very wary and they, of course they have to be because this is the kind of place where they can easily be ambushed by leopards and lions. This is the view that you get from where I am. I am perched somewhere high and I'm looking down into the valley and it is beautiful. Down there is what we call the riverine forest and in the forest you get all those beautiful um, tropical birds like Narina trogon, uh, black and white cask hornbill, um, barbets, woodpeckers, owls, that is the kind of habitat that you find them over where I am. You find mostly the grassland birds like cysticolas, wagtails, larks, and eaters, and eating chats. That's what you find over here. Um, over there is also a small patch of forest with diasporas abyssinica trees, and that is a good area for rhinos. Yes, and the valley, the hills you see a long way up there are Aitong Hills and that is the north, most northern part of the Mara. So this is the kind of habitat I am in and it's favored mostly by, you know, the antelopes from Topi, Grand's Gazelle, Thompson's, Bushback, Waterback, but I don't see them anywhere well, from where I am. Of course, sometimes it's a good sign when you don't see any animal because it means there is a predator somewhere. The grass that is most common here is Thamida triandra, which is in the oat family or the wheat family and rice. So it's highly nutritious and that's one of the main reasons why you find these guys here, the topi. And also that's why you find the wildebeest roaming from the plains of southern Serengeti all the way up here. Walking here for topis, they have to be very cautious. Heads high, you know, ears, you know, forwards and eyes, you know, wide open because any bush is a good bush for an ambush, you know, by the lions. I'm in Owino's territory and I am looking for them. If in case you don't know, when I say Owino's, we have a pride of lion. We call them the Owinos, and they have two males. Yeah, um, the big male is called Lalashe, and he's got a young male. We, we, they're always calling him young, young, young. We need to get a name for him. Young for, in Swahili, young means Kijana. So we might call him Kijana. I don't know if it's too stick. That's all, those are the ones that I'm looking. This is their prime estate. This is where they come to hunt. I haven't seen them in two days. Oh, there's a warthog. You see gems along there. Yeah, those are the kind of things they go for warthogs. Oh, the topi has decided to be on the lookout. This is one unique behavior about topis. They find a high perch and they declare themselves self in reclaimed watchmen. 
and they watch over everybody else. Of course, it is a very ad added advantage for them to be high up like that because no lion or leopard can really like stalk them from that height. They would see it and they would warn everybody else. So it is one animal that does that and it is a very unique behavior that it does that. Well, speaking of height and termite mounds, we are swinging around to see one and hopefully there'll be some little things playing about. I've had good luck before coming to the den when I'm live with you all, so I thought let's give it a go again. I would love, love to see these cubs before I leave today. This is a forktail drongo making some noise here. Fine, we'll let's just see. Give him a quick look. Oh, never mind. It's saying to me, hurry up, go to the den. Don't waste my time with you. It's fine. So yes, I would love to see these little cubs before I leave today. Could it be the day that I get my woodpeckers as well? Can you see it there, Theo? I've been looking for all four of them. Ah, oh, it's flown off. Oh, no, you haven't. This is great, yay. It looks like a cardinal. Well, I'm pretty happy about that. We've seen a cardinal woodpecker and a bearded woodpecker already today. Is any fish not on, Mr. Kai? Sims, I'm just approaching it. I'll let you know if it's active. So this one's a much, much smaller woodpecker. This little one is only about 30 grams. The beaded woodpecker that we saw earlier, that one is about 80 grams. So you can see this one has a little beak and quite a little body as well. They're quite easy to identify because of that streaked, streaked chest and body. And they've got a really, really nice brown sort of forecrown, a forehead. Now the only other one that has a streaked breast or underpath is a golden-tailed woodpecker. And for them, both the male and the female have red bits on their head. Okay, let's head off to the den and see if anything's happening there. Now I have to find a golden tail woodpecker, right? And a Bennett's. Alright, so the den is now in front of me. Let's have a quick look. Unlucky. Oh well. Hopefully we'll be able to go back to Tingana sometime soon. Welcome back to Ambion Pinde, everyone. We've been on quite an adventure, driving through a drainage line, uh, up and over hills and down into some valleys, but we managed to keep up with the lions. The, the young males actually spooked a little gr a group of mongoose, and the mongoose came running past our vehicle, and then literally three minutes later 
the lions came like looking for the mongoose, thinking that they're hot on the heels of the mongoose, but the mongoose were long gone. So yeah, we've had a little bit of a a sighting while you were you were away, but they are they have found a spot to rest. It's starting to heat up, and I think their activity is slowly slowing down. The males are still investigating things that catch their attention, but there's a lot of resting happening in between. Uh, Josh is asking, will these males join the coalition? So. Those two males that we were watching earlier, those are their fathers. Uh, we're not sure exactly which one would be the father of these cubs, but there could be one father for two of the cubs and, and one father for the other, for the third. But they will, when these, when these young males get to an age where they start competing for for mating rights with the females and they start um, throwing their weight around too much then those dominant males their fathers will actually drive them out of this pride and then they will go and be nomadic males which I know you were watching uh, yesterday afternoon so they will fill that that role for about two maybe three years try to build some size and strength and and then eventually when they are big and strong they will try to find a pride to take over and usually in a, a very different area because when their fathers chase them out then they will usually move into a, a, a different coalition or a different male lion's territory and then he will drive them out of his territory and, and so the story goes and the males will move further and further from their home pride uh, but then by the time that they're ready to compete they will be in a completely different area and hopefully take over a different pride and then spread their genetics so that's actually how lion genetics remain and are very strong uh, and of and very diverse because they get moved so far away from their home home pride so these males will form their own coalition, they will not join the other coalition. So Tammy, if you look at the... Tammy's asking how old these cubs are. Uh, if you look at the main development, so that little mohawk that they're starting to get on the back of their neck, these are three young males, uh, but the hook on the back of the neck and then on the, around the shoulders and on the chest below the chin, they're starting to get little tufts of fur. And those, well, they've, they've already started to develop the, the tufts of fur, but those, the mane starts to grow between 14 and 16 months. And theirs has already grown quite a bit, so uh, they're around 18 to 20 months old, so almost two years. Is there a dominant male with these young ones yet? Gosling is asking. So. Uh, yes, there will definitely be one, uh, more especially when they're feeding, that will dominate over the others. But there's lots of competition uh, in amongst them. And so, especially when it comes to a kill, but uh, when they get older, they will constantly jostle amongst themselves and compete for, for dominance. Um, and even with those adult males that we saw earlier on, they there is one that is dominant over the other. So, yeah, there definitely is a dominant one, and then there's a hierarchy. So there's a second, uh, and then there will be the least dominant one uh, of the three of them. But we're gonna try and get another look at these lions and uh, hopefully show you them again. 
here maybe just by repositioning you'll have a better view of the same lions and i've always thought the dynamics of the lion coalitions are always very interesting to follow and especially when they're trying to overthrow uh, one coalition now things have gotten a bit quiet here by the river as you can see all the herds i had before some that crossed, some that were not very lucky to do that. The ones that didn't cross have gone back to the thickets and the bush. The ones that crossed went further away. And you can see the aftermath of a crossing. It's a croc there with a wildebeest. And the whole idea is just to stay put here and wait for the same animals to regroup. Some of them were in the water and they made the U-turn and I think they were quite traumatized. So it may take them an hour or two, sometimes even a day uh, to build more courage to come and attempt to cross the river. So the trees you see in the background there and the thicket, those bushes, that's where all of them have gone. And I would imagine they're feeding at the moment. Because as you can see, that area is full of rocks and doesn't have very uh, good grass. More crocodiles take a long time to eat. They eat very, very slowly. And if, for example, she is full at the moment, she may not even bother eating uh, the wildebeest that she caught for herself. And stashing it in water, those are hippos trying to interrupt me, stashing it's killing the water will keep it fresh as long as it would last. So I would not be surprised if she'll have this meal for the next two weeks, sometimes even a month. They eat very slowly, and you know they do not like chew uh, their kills. They'll always cut them in small little bits as they swallow. So I'm not sure why she's staying very close to it but it may take another two weeks, three weeks, or even a month because it will remain fresh in the water. It was quite a moment to see all those animals cross. And as I was saying earlier, I've been here a couple of mornings and not very lucky until today. Is always the wheel of the wind and it's very difficult to read the language of these animals. Luna, what will happen? These animals, because they've been here for the last, say, since the end of July, early August, when they walk in the savannah, they churn a lot of soil, they walk over the grass, they eat most of it, and as they leave, the savanna tends to remain bare. Now, coming to mid of this month towards October, we shall be getting the short trains. Now, the soil will have been turned around. These animals have left a lot of droppings, which would be like natural manure or natural fertilizer. And with the rains coming, we are going to see a brand new savanna with fresh grass shooting up and growing. And by the time they come back again, Next year, they'll have a lot to eat. The herbivores that remain behind, like the giraffes and the buffaloes, are the ones that will be enjoying what will be left behind or what will grow before these animals come back again. I just hope that this will be will come again by the river and I am going to remain right here. I have found the most beautiful weeping boar bean that is flowering. 
See, there's some starlings in there, but look at those flowers. Pockets of red all over the place. Oh, can you hear Satin Boo Boo calling in the background? My favorite call, that is. I can't imitate it, though. <laughs> That's my best imitation. I, mean, I can't whistle, guys. I'm not good at it. I love it. So here we have a weeping poem. And like I said, in full bloom. It's so gorgeous to see. Really nice, striking green colors and that beautiful crimson as well of the flowers. That'll be dripping quite a bit of nectar. You see the most beautiful sunbirds come through there. You can see that the starlings are having quite a good time too. Lots of birds will take advantage of nectar just because it's in exorbitant amounts. As the name suggests, weeping boar bean because the flowers drip nectar so profusely. Pretty, so, so pretty. So we have two types of boer beans here. Dwarf boer bean, which is Scotia capitata. Then we have this one, which is the weeping boer beans, Scotia brachypetala. The dwarf boer bean, as the name suggests, is much smaller. And these ones can get quite large and as they grow very big you'll see that the branches start to actually fall and weep as well at least i think so lisa you say this is a very pretty tree isn't it just lisa i'm letting it know on your behalf lisa says you're a very pretty tree it really is the spots of reds i, I actually had to stop to and pull out my binoculars and actually have a good look to see that i wasn't looking at leaves that had turned red because there's so many little collections of these flowers. Lots of animals enjoy these flowers too, for obvious reasons. Nice sweet nectar. Get warthogs, monkeys, baboons, even some antelope. Hello, Starling. Enjoying yourself there. There you can see, can you see those extra limbs almost? These limbs look a bit awkward at the top. Those ones tend to fall over. Not, I mean, sometimes they do break off, but they they, the crown seems to droop just a little bit, which is why for me, Weeping Boar Bean is just such a good name because it weeps from its flowers and then the branches also kind of weep. Just beautiful signs of spring have arrived. It's warm. I'm just very, very happy. Well, remember, guys, this is happening live. This is your safari, so you can use the hashtag Wild Earth, the hashtag CGT and Wild, the YouTube chat stream, whatever you like, where we can get to you. Please ask us your questions and give us your comments. And we'll be so happy to have a conversation with you guys. Now, I think that about half an hour, 45 minutes, we'll be able to go back to Tingana, which would be awesome. And I'm going to start moving in that direction, just in case he gets on the move. Yep, see, you'd like to know, giraffe enjoy these flowers. They will occasionally take these flowers, but they especially like nopton flowers. Because of the sweetness and the nectar, in these flowers, many different antelope will get them. In fact, when birds go about their business on the tree, getting the nectar, they 
can sometimes drop these flowers and even baboons and monkeys that are up there can drop the flowers and that's how antelope take advantage of them but you will occasionally see giraffes also giving it a bit of a go Even warthogs like it, which is very cute to see when there's a cute little red flower on the ground and a warthog is, is jumping on it. It's quite special. Oh, do we have a little squirrel friend at the bottom there too? They are the masters at playing statue. Sometimes you won't see them move at all. I had an encounter with a squirrel in the kitchen yesterday. Theo and I, actually. A squirrel came out right to the door of the kitchen and stared at us. So, so pretty. Well, I'm sure that we're going to see a lot more colors emerging as we move steadily and surely into our warmer and wetter seasons. I can't wait. I'm sure on my return the bush will be a completely different place. Welcome back to Ambion Pinde, everyone. We've found a straight line of lions. <laughs> so they moved a little bit further down this this um, drainage line and in, into one of these little open clearings. And it looks like mom is just enjoying a little bit of sun, but these youngsters are have already hit the shade. They've been playing and burning a little bit of energy, so I think they're a bit hot, but there's mom, she's in the sun, and then that young male behind her is in the shade. So it is, it is uh, looking like it's going to be quite a hot day today, and so the males seem to be settling down into the shade already, but mom just enjoying a little bit of sun at the moment, the sun is hitting the spot we often see lions uh, and the other cats like finding a sunny spot in the morning especially after a really cold night they'll find an open patch with some good sunlight hitting it and just spend a bit of time warming up but just like last night when we were watching well not last night but yesterday afternoon when we were watching them Starting the waking up process, the the resting process takes pretty much the same path where they will move quite a bit in the early stages and then they'll find a spot to rest and their rest will be quite short and then they'll get up and move again and then the next time they rest it'll be for a little bit longer and then that, that uh, period where they rest will get longer and longer and longer and the period where they move will get shorter and shorter until eventually they find the spot where they're going to settle down for the day. We've been treated quite nicely to a bit of behavior and movement um, of these lions on Pinda, uh, but we're going to go and have a look at some of the lion dynamics uh, in the Mara. Dawn is a special time to be with the lions of the Mara. The grasses, lions' coats, and sunrise makes a hundred shades of gold. Stunning as the scene is, leading up to the migration, prides can suffer a lean few months. But the arrival of the herds brings relief for the hard-working lionesses that support such a pride. 
hunting is easier. The wildebeest and zebra are plentiful. With full bellies, growing cubs can focus on play, while the bounty of the season is relief for the mothers. Okay, welcome back to the Mara. I'm still here in the plains, hoping to find something. Uh, this is the place I normally come. We normally come and just um, sometimes park and see if we can spot something. Usually, you might not see something immediately, but it doesn't mean that there is nothing. Things are moving, animals are on the movement, and if you wait long enough, if there's something, you might get to see it. Uh, today it's very overcast, the sun hasn't come out, so it's perfect for lions or predators to be out hunting, also for the grazers to be out grazing because it's not hot, so it's very pleasant. Remember to talk to me on hashtag CGTN Wild, hashtag Wild Earth. Questions and comments are very, very welcome. Yeah, it is a wonderful morning and I'm happy to be out here. I hope you're enjoying, you know, our morning with us for, for the, you know, from this uh, live game drive, you know, um, out of the Masai Mara. Look at the landscape. Breathtaking. It is uh, very beautiful and I'm going to try and move on, try and find something for you guys next time you find me. Welcome back to Ambion Pinde, everyone. We've just been admiring this male lion's mohawk. And goof. There hasn't been much change. They are still lying down, but something caught their attention which we couldn't hear. Their ears are a lot more... Uh, fine-tuned to the bush and their hearing is much better than ours. They heard something and the three young males lifted their heads and looked in the same direction and listened for a little bit and then lay back down. So we haven't seen the their fathers for quite a while now. I think since more than an hour ago. They literally got up from the watering hole where we were viewing them and moved off and we didn't see them again. So they might still be somewhere close to the water hole where we've come from. So the, the young males were looking back in that direction. So maybe they heard some movement in the bush and the, it, was, it was maybe coming from those big male lions. Uh, or maybe they heard the mongoose that they tried to catch earlier. But we'll just sit and enjoy these scenes for now. So we have been driving around, um, trying to follow up on that hyena that was calling up on this ridge and we came across a pile of feathers. Not too old, not super fresh, but not old. And it looks like there was a, a murder that happened here. Something was, was killed. And we went a bit closer to those feathers to investigate. And I think, we believe this was probably an owl that was caught by something. We're not sure which owl, uh, but I went and collected a few feathers so I could show you a bit closer as to why I think it was an owl. So, the reason why I think it was an owl is, if you look at these feathers over here that I've collected, they are very, very um, soft and they've got almost like a furriness to them. I mean, if you, if you have a look really, really closely, you'll notice the edges are all very, very if I put it a bit closer so you get a nice contrast, the edges of these are all very frayed and very soft, and owls have that so that when they're flying, uh, the, the sound of the wind passing over their feathers doesn't make a lot of noise. It's very, very soft. And if you look even closer over here, you can notice that it almost looks like they've got fur covering their feathers. It's not rigid and hard like most bird feathers. These are quite furry almost and soft. Could even be a young owl that was maybe taking one of its first flights out of, the, out of its uh, nest 
and got caught by, by something. But very, very interesting and very well camouflaged as well. So now I'm sure you, you know a little bit about owls and how they are very, very good at, at having silent flight because, of course, when they're catching their, their prey, what they're doing most of the time is they're using their sense of hearing to pinpoint where something is crawling around in the grass and their eyesight, if possible, if it's not too dark. And then as they fly, they, they'll leave a branch and it'll be silent when they fly off the branch. And as they swoop towards the prey, they can actually listen as they're flying without the noise of their wings. So they can keep pinpointing where that prey is and the prey won't know that they're coming. So there was a very, very good uh, documentary. I can't remember what it was called now. When they filmed, they actually showed the... Uh, a bird, like a dove, like a smallish bird, flying over a candle, and the candle blew out. And then they did an owl flying over it, which is a much larger bird. And when the owl flew over it, the candle barely flickered. And that's just how, how silent they can fly. They disturb the air at absolute minimum. So this is really, really cool. I'm going to keep hold of these feathers so that I can maybe uh, get a second opinion from a few people to try and figure out what exactly this might be, what, what, what owl this could be. Maybe you, the viewers, can also give me, a, give me a heads up what you think it might be. Ooh, Lucas, birds do grow their feathers back. Uh, if they lose them, they can grow back slowly. So what will happen, um, I used to have a, I think it was a cockatiel as a pet when I was younger, and it would have feathers that fell out every year. And then these little uh, things that looked like, uh, like porcupine quills would start growing out of wherever the feathers were missing. And eventually they, the birds would preen them and, sc and scratch them, and they would open up into tiny little feathers that would slowly grow larger. So certainly if this, I mean, you can see there's a chunk of flesh there on the right-hand side of the screen where all the feathers are attached together. So this was a kill. This bird is not going to be growing back any feathers because it's currently sitting inside the belly of whatever predator caught it. But if it was just chased by something and a few feathers got pulled out, not to worry. As long as it wasn't too many, uh, they'll grow back just fine. It'll continue to be able to fly, no problem at all. Even if it pulled out loads and it couldn't fly anymore, as long as it's able to escape the danger and then go back to its nest or hole in a tree, it'll be able to, to grow those feathers back, no problem at all. Which is great. I mean, I'm super, I'm super excited that we got to see this. It's not often that we get to see owl feathers like this because owls are very ferocious predators on their own. Um, on their own. So, so mostly the owls are the ones doing the killing. Uh, we've seen many uh, videos of large owls like eagle owls um, catching eagles that are day active as they sit on their nests at night. So that's pretty awesome. So this might have been an owl earlier in the evening, a young, small owl that got caught by a larger one. Who, who really knows? It's quite, a, it's quite a mystery. But in the meantime, whilst we try and figure out what happened with this particular owl and these feathers, what we're going to do is head back to where we thought we heard the hyena and actually go for a bit of a walk there just to investigate if we have a new den site. It will be great if that is the case. Mm. That sounds very interesting. Now I've been diverted firstly to this tree by a potential woodpecker that is now nowhere to be seen. But I can hear it. It's a bearded woodpecker. Oh, there we go. Now I've been di distracted down this way because obviously I went to the den and nothing was happening there. And then I saw hyena tracks on the southern fire break heading in an easterly direction so I want to check out that Gwen's old den on Cheetah Cut Line Junction this fire break just in case I have seen it before I have gone to visit it and I haven't seen anything but I think that we should we should just go and check it out maybe I'll be lucky today Colson, you'd like to know what the difference between a bull and a beak is? There's no difference, they're the same things. They're just different words for the same thing. Sometimes you'll hear bull more closely associated or more used more in relation to water birds and, and birds that have a, quite a large beak, but not necessarily. And if you look at bird books and bird apps, they'll be using the same, they'll be using both those words interchangeably. Orange-breasted bushrike in the background as well. 
calling. Do, 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 do. I'm so glad to see the birds out in full force. Melody, you'd like to know if we have great horned owls here. No, we don't. The owls that we get in this area, mostly the African Scops owl, the Varroa's eagle owl, the spotted eagle owl, um, sudden white-faced owl, and then our two owlets, pearl spotted owlet and African barred owlet. So much going on in this tree. <gasps> okay, there's an orange breasted bush strike. Oh, it's just flown away. It's just our luck. Hang on, hang on. Let me have my eye on it again. I'm gonna creep forward because I'm a creep. <laughs> so, because I really like that song. And you see it there in the branch down there, Theo? Really gorgeous. Where did you go? Well, you can hear it calling. I've got to find it for you. Sorry about that, guys, but we're still here at this tree. Let me now see a shadow of a woodpecker, which I think is pretty cool. I've been looking for the orange-breasted bushrike that I could hear and that I saw, but unable to show you. So nice to see all the birds out and about. really want to get you this orange bristed bush strike, but I can't seem to see it anymore. At least we have our shadow of the woodpecker. Let me go just a little bit forward, see if we can actually see the body. Let's try that. Still a shadow, is it there? Is it even really there? <laughs> That's very cool. There it is! <laughs> that is, that is quite cool. And you can actually have a really nice look at the facial markings of the bearded woodpeckers. So obviously, like I said before, we first saw it earlier in drive. This is a male. You can tell by the white crown. I'm sorry, the red crown. And you can see that the facial markings, that black and white, is really obvious. And on their forehead, their forecrown, is a polka dot. It's very, very pretty black with white spots. Get 
right in there. It's awesome to see that tongue. something there. I don't know, just some bark on him. And the rest of the tree has gotten quiet. I was really hoping I'd be able to show you that bush strike. Slava, you say this one is your favorite woodpecker of them all. And with that comment, the woodpecker has become shy, horse lover. Well, they are absolutely stunning, really stunning birds. Like I said, they're the biggest ones we get around here, so you can see the features really nicely, and that's why they're a good example. And I like to stop whenever I see them. I think I'd like to move on and check out that old de old den, and then maybe Bufflesuck Dam, and then swing back towards Gallego Shortcut from the north. Check if if there's a space for me at Tingana. So many beautiful birds have come out to play. I'll stop whenever I see one that I'd like to share. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Mara. And here I have found three lionesses and they are seriously on a serious hunt. We cannot see what they have seen, but looks like they have surrounded it. I don't know what it is, but definitely there is something. This one uh, is moving towards the bush there, but there is a few, you know, two more females. You see the other one further up. She's stalking that bush. We cannot see what they are going for. Remember, teamwork pays and they're much more successful when they are together and they are doing their best right now to go around that bush. We don't know exactly what they are going for. Remember, this is life. Talk to us, CGTN World, um, Wild Earth. That is the best, you know, the, the, the only way to talk to us right now because this is life. I'm so excited. I don't know if they'll be successful today. These are the three Owino girls that we saw the other day going for Warthog. I don't know what they are going for today. Look at that. Look how she's moving one step at a time, focused, ready to go for whatever is there. We cannot see what they are going for. I tell you, I don't know. Okay, she's walking much faster. I don't know if she sees it. The other girl is way farther ahead and she's coming around, but we cannot see her. She's off the frame. Okay, she's running. Are we gonna... Passed it. They missed it again. Yeah, it was a warthog. They didn't manage. It was a warthog. It's amazing that, you know, they could see it, but we could not see it. How they picked it up, I don't know. But that was really, really cool. She's still going. I don't know if she, she thinks that it might stop. But that was really, really cool to see. Yeah, we couldn't see the warthog from where I was. And uh, they were really, really serious on it but they didn't manage. They are very hungry now. They haven't eaten for, for th about three days. And now that, that they have missed, I think now they're even more desperate to see, you know, to catch something. So I'm gonna wait for them you know, to decide if they're gonna rest or restart another new hunt. That was amazing and that was live and it happened just, 
here in the Masai, Ram, Masai Mara, in the Mara Triangle. So exciting, I hope you know you're enjoying yourself. Teaser, you ask if this, um, this pride is known to hunt warthogs regularly. The, there is a season they hunt warthogs. When the big game is gone, they depend on warthogs because warthogs are resident and they don't go anywhere and they can provide a meal, whatever they need, they need one. So they hunt them this time of the year when all the big game is out of this area, they depend on warthogs. But come, you know, the migration when the zebra and the wildebeest are all here, then they can change and go for larger antelopes and zebra. Yeah, look, see, she's a bit tired. She's panting. You can tell her mouth is open. She's trying to locate her sisters. There are three of them, and one has got a very pale color. You will notice that when they stand, you know, together. I don't know if we can, um, we can see it. Oh, where? There she is. There she is. She's very pale. This one. I think they are going. They're trying to locate each other. I think they are doing a mistake every time they go for warthogs. They get too excited and start chasing before they really close in and uh, the warthogs is so nimble and fast and so they sprint out of their sight really fast. Wagana, you ask if they get more desperate when they, uh, when they, when they lose. Of course they do. Um, yes, they get really, really into it. They really want to get something. And I, I think, you know, they normally ask themselves, why did we, what mistake did we do? And I think they rectified and try to get a meal as soon as possible. So they do really get desperate the moment they miss a hunt. Yeah, they're coming to the, you know, to the area that's very lush and it's always got a warthog or a topi and I think they are going to restart and try once more. Here she comes. She's coming towards us. And they're coming towards an area that's full of warthogs. You cannot stop somewhere high and look down and not see a warthog. Yeah, they haven't eaten since I last saw them three days ago. Rick, uh, how long can they go without food? They can go for up to eight days without eating. Seven to eight days without eating. But uh, then they're very, very desperate when they reach that. Yeah, but um, after eating a good meal, I've seen a lioness go for up to about 12, but they need a meal at least every seven days without, you know, without eating one. They're coming, you know, and they are very determined. So I'm going to reposition so I can see where they're heading if there is something. Is she going to go around? Yes, she's going around that bush. You can tell that she's very careful every time she comes on higher ground when she's looking down so nobody sees her. And she is looking down now. I don't know if she sees anything. Remember those uh, eyes are like binoculars. They can see quite far. And actually they can even tell what they are looking at. So when she goes somewhere high like that, she uses the high points to survey what is around and what they can go for. It's amazing how they can see very tiny little things in the bushes that we can't see. You know, from where she is, I'm sure she's going to spot something. See what, you know, the expression in their faces. Eyes wide, ears, you know, pushed forwards. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, they're really desperate. They need a meal either today or now. Yeah, that's a sister. That's a sister heading away on the opposite side that uh, is very pale. Yeah, I know her. You know, now I know her now. She's very, very pale.
Now, that's the challenge of uh, losing migration or the migration moving back uh, to Serengeti because when they're here, it's always very easy for these lions just to turn around, you know, and very easily bring down the wildebeest like you're seeing in the back, in the background there. But once they are all gone, they are left with small little bits of animals to, or the, the, the choice of prey is limited, and they're left trying animals like warthogs, sometimes hedgehogs, sometimes pangolins, and then moving to bigger animals. Now, this is the herd that was in the water, came out, and very quickly moved out to those thickets. So seeing there, but I think the trauma has gone down from what they went through trying to cross the river. And they're slowly showing signs of wanting maybe to give it another shot. This is quite a good herd, quite a good number of these wildebeest. But it's still got so many of them in the thickets there. Because in those rocks, not much, I would say, uh, they could be feeding on. They just need to come where we are. Migration, basically, we think, you know, two, th two, two reasons make them move. Number one, breeding, and number two, feeding. And since they have, been, they have been here, you know, end of July or early August, I would say they have exhausted uh, most of the grass, as you can see there. And mainly, they have to cross this river because that's the direction that will take them to Serengeti National Park, to the south, before the females who are all pregnant by now will start uh, dropping their calves in the month of February next year. The hippos are still stuck in the water. They haven't come out. A few crocs too. Just two crocs or three. And you notice how they coexist specifically with the hippos. Okay, the hippos having their eyes and nostrils and their ears above their heads. That way they're able to see what's happening out there. Then go down. Then once in a while, they'll be up for a breath. Three to five minutes. That's the time they take before they come for fresh oxygen. But times they've been known to go for up to 10 minutes, depending uh, on what is outside there, should there be a concern of a predator. Well, he paused when it warms up. I'll be happy to see you out of the water as I wait for the wildebeest to come down. Well, we have some impala that are sitting very, very comfortably. Don't they look great? Everyone's pretty happy. They had a slight moment of alertness, but then it all passed quite quickly. Look at that. Having a good time, I'd say. There's one zebra that's been hanging around with this impala that has now moved away. But that's okay. We're going to head off towards Buffalo so Dam that we're not too far from. And hopefully there'll be some elephants, elephants splashing around. Not my tools. We are so lucky. We've had reports of lions following a herd of buffalo close to the northern boundary of the lands. You can hear other vehicles. We're right on the boundary, so there are other vehicles here. These lions look like they were interested in the buffalo, but they seem to have rested for now on a termite mound, and they're just waiting to see what they might do next. They're looking towards our boundary. I'm hoping that they turn around and come back into Pride Lands. They're right on our boundary right now, but it's amazing. There's a whole group. It looks like maybe three or four lionesses at least. We can only see one for now. There's another female who is on the other side of our of our boundary. She's just uh, right now. Sorry about all the vehicles are going to go past in a second, but this female here is lactating. It looks like she's maybe 
lactating. Oh, goodness gracious me. There you go. So this female here, she's just moved off a little bit and looks sounded like she made a low alarm call, or not alarm call, like a contact call. So she might actually have cubs somewhere in the area. We're not sure, we're not 100% sure. But she moved off, she made a small low contact call and then she sat down there. It looks like she's looking back this way. She might come back towards us. I hope that she does. I'm not sure what pride this is either. There are at least four lions here. She's a beautiful young lioness. When I first saw her, I thought it might have been Lagatha, but she's lactating, so I don't think so. Absolutely wonderful to see. Oh, what did she see? Oh, there's something maybe moving in the drainage line. You see how her ears perked up there for a moment. I wonder what's going on down there. We know there's a whole herd of buffalo, and they've been following them. But I don't know if there's any male lions in the group. We haven't been able to see them super clearly. So, it might be that if there are no male lions here yet, they might not want to attempt attacking that herd of buffalo because we know how, how well they can defend themselves. How awesome is this? So the other lioness is still just sitting right there on that uh, termite mound. It's a wonderful spot to be. It was very cold this morning, very chilly, but now it's starting to, to warm up and she's taking full advantage. We've, we've taken full advantage, or she is taking full advantage of this sunlight on this nice sunny winter or late winter morning. Also just listening around, you see how she's very focused, very intent on whatever it might be around here. The other two lionesses we saw just before we saw these two that we've been with now were walking around where the buffaloes were. So we're just waiting to hear some sign or sound of if those other lions are going to attempt to hunt and whether these two will go and join them. This is so great. I think we found our spot for the rest of the morning. Still with these lovely impala because I have an impala horn I wanted to show you. I promise I didn't take it off an impala, I found it on the road. But here you can see that he has a great example of some stunning horns. Here's my horn. This is horn number two. I have had one previously that I did find, and this one is quite long. I would say this is about almost 50 centimeters. You can see the ridges along it. Now, apart from these ridges, there's also these much thinner ones. Can you see that? And that all of this creates good friction for when the animals are clashing their horns together so that you don't get them slipping and things like that. And they actually fit quite nicely between these ridges. Now, if I turn it and we look inside of it you can see it's actually come clean off it's come clean off my dash that's what's happened <laughs> it's live everyone live I can't set these things up you get to be here when all these things happen so you see it's come kind of clean off so the head of the impala and any other animal that produces horns antelopes they have a little bud where growth begins. And this would have been attached to the bud. Actually that side, you can see it's quite rounded. And it's actually broken clean off, which is quite interesting. I wonder if this is actually from a carcass that something had a go at, as opposed to just a falling off a skull. And if you look in here, there's these pockets. This is all bone around these pockets, very hard. These little pockets are actually an extension of the sinus of the animal. And a sinus is just blood-filled cavities, essentially. And that extends quite up to the horn. I haven't dissected a horn, as you can imagine. It's very, very difficult. And But it ha I have seen it extend quite far up, at least about maybe 10 to 15 centimeters up. For whether it extends further, I'm not sure. 
Here you have the keratinized outer sheet. Sheet. There we go. It's basically dead. Dead keratin or dried up keratin. And in here, if we look in there, there's the keratin that would have been more active and a little softer and actually a bit more kind of cartilage-like or collagen-like. And along there and against that, this bone, because this is a central bone, along this bone you'd see little blood vessels, tiny little ones. And these will actually continue to grow throughout the animal's life. It's just that the growth becomes slower and slower as the animal grows. Isn't this a beautiful specimen? I think it's stunning. Let's make sure it doesn't roll off. I think it's really lovely. Gorgeous curve to make that lyre-shaped horns that impalas have. Welcome back, guys. But I cannot speak loudly because the lions are on the hunt once again. It is very intense right now. They have surrounded another two warthogs and you can tell that one is flanking the warthogs from the bottom side and she's quite a distance away on the southern side there is one very close to me and it's moving you cannot see it and that one now you can see she's really on the stalking mode so i don't know what's going to happen let's hope you know they're going to get a meal she's moving in now from the southern side and there is one from the western side I am actually way on the western side and they're all moving in now. See this one is coming from the western side and it's the closest one to the warthogs so any moment there might be a hunt happening. Let's wait and see. She's really close. We're going to have almost her and the warthogs on the same frame shortly. Let's see. Are they gonna make a kill or not this time? This is life. It's happening now in the Masai Mara. So exciting. You cannot believe this. I cannot be louder than what I am. But it is very tense. She's down on her haunches. The warthogs are only 60 feet away. One is very oblivious of her. And you know, both of them, they're not even aware that she's around. And there's another lioness further down. Yeah, is she gonna move again? She's down on her haunches, ready to pounce any moment. I cannot speak louder than this because if I do that, I will attract the attention of the warthogs. And while looking at me, they might look around and see the lioness. I hope you're enjoying this. Any moment, we might see a hunt. This is another ultimate experience. The warthog might have heard me. That's why I was trying to speak quiet. They are very smart warthogs and they are very curious. She might wonder why I'm talking, why I'm here and might take off. Remember, the lions have to eat. It might sound cruel, it might sound like I'm happy, but the lions have to eat the lionesses and they work so hard. This is when, when you see the other side of lionesses. When they get really serious and they get into business, and they mean business here. They are born to kill. This is a true predator and it's at its work, at its best. Look at the focus. I'm so excited. I don't know what's happening. Is there the lioness? Yes, she's coming from the southern side. Look at that. This is pure coordination and teamwork. Now, this one is coming from the southern side. I don't know if they're going to make it or not, but let's wait and see. I'll just let the camera do its work and see what's going to happen. KD, you ask if they're hunting techniques develop over time of course it's like wine tastes better you know as it is the lionesses perfect their hunting skills as they age you know here all three are very experienced and 
what teamwork they've played here is unbelievable. There is one on the southern side, one on the northern side, and one on the western side. So they actually have formed a sort of a mini triangle. Any time they might pounce, I don't know, you see the other one is moving in now, the pale one is moving in now from the other side. So they have pinned the warthogs in the middle and each one of them has got a chance because there's too much cover around here of the bushes. So they're actually on the upper side on this one. But who am I to say anything? Let's wait and see. I'm watching from my tiny little skin in the screen so I cannot see in real life what is happening there. I'm telling you depending on what James is pointing, but everything seems to be in position now. Let's wait and see any moment it can happen. This warthogs, you can tell they have relaxed and this is sometimes what I really like because I'm not interfering at all. They're doing their own thing. We're using our nice zoom. Yeah, you know, we're using our zoom to, you know, show you this so we don't interfere at all. Look at the concentration. If you were human and stayed in that position for very long, you'd get muscle pulls, but they are built for this. Look, she's on her haunches, on her belly. She's just looking at the other lioness on the southern side to see if it's getting closer. I cannot see it, but now she's moving in. Look at this, guys. Okay, any moment it might happen. Remember, it's not guaranteed. Their success rate is not as high as other predators like hyena and wild dog. It's only about six to seven for every 10 trials. So, but they really um, desperately need a meal today because they have gone for about maybe five days since I started following them. Yeah, is she moving? Now, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Looks like the warthogs are moving away. They are moving away. They have the sixth sense. They know, you know, they are moving away from the lionesses. So it's still not guaranteed. But let's wait and see. That one is listening. It's watching. It, you know, they're very smart warthogs. And it might be looking at the vehicle trying to see if there's something behind the vehicle i don't know if there's any other lioness closer yeah there she is she's coming in another lioness the pale one she's moving in yeah still not very close though yeah let's wait and see once they're in the same frame then you know it's very close that is a predator's serious stalking mode and anytime she might go if she thinks she's close enough Very exciting. Very exciting. Okay, she gonna go. Where's the other lioness? It's, it's over here. Yeah, all of them are in position, but the warthogs have moved slightly off their target. And anything can go wrong now. If the warthogs decide to, like, run towards in front of me, then it's done. There's no more hunt. She... Once it goes in from that, in behind that bush, she might move faster. Look at this. This is what I was expecting. Yeah. If it goes behind that bush, the, you know, the lioness is going to move in faster. Now they're in line. I think. Okay, there we go. Is she going to move in? Hey, guys. I hope you're enjoying this. I'm enjoying it too. I'm almost... Uh, hoping that they get it, but if they don't get it, they are lions, they are meant to struggle a little bit. Let's wait and see if it goes behind that bush, she might come running. That's what I'm waiting for, for the warthog to go in front of that bush. It means it will be behind, the lioness will be behind and she might come running. This one is the target now, according to what I see here. Looks like that one is the target. That is the pale female and she's only about 60 feet, maybe 70 only. They are sort of, they are sort of in a triangle, but not a perfect one. 
if they were in a perfect one, one would have changed. The only mistake now that would happen here is the, for the warthog to run towards one of them. Then it's done. Okay, look at this. You know, the warthog is moving deeper into the triangle, which means not very good for the warthog. Oh dear. Yeah, if it goes more right, it's going to pull the other one, and chances of both of them being killed increases. But if he moves all by himself, it means he might be the only one. Who am I to say anything? It's very exciting, guys. I cannot predict anything. It's still not guaranteed. Remember, this is nature's at its best. Both of them are in struggle for survival. The warthogs need to survive, and the lions need to survive also. But over here, situations are 50-50. They still, you know, in a distance where they can run away, the warthogs, and they're very good sprinters. And especially when they, you know, they know that the lion is in pursuit. Yeah. They are listening. I think they can hear me, but I don't know because I'm quite a distance. But I hopefully, you know, they're not hearing me, but you can tell this, they can sense there is something. Yeah, very much like our domestic pigs, they are very smart. Oh dear, this is not very good for that warthog. If it moves further, it means it's getting deeper into the trap. Yeah, that's what, that's what we don't want. And when it does that, it's going to pull the other warthog and I don't know. I hope you all enjoying this. This is lions hunting in the African wilderness, the Mara Triangle, Masai Mara. You're watching this on hashtag, you know, talk to us on hashtag CGTN Wild, hashtag Wild Earth. We're bringing you this is live. It's happening now here in the Masai Mara. The weather is perfect. It's cool. Uh, it's not hot at all. Perfect for lions hunting and also there's no wind. Look at this. It's moving towards the lioness. Is it going to happen? Is it now? I think that is an ad added advantage to the... Francis, thank you for your question. Can the warthog not smell the lions? I don't think there is enough wind. And also, it's quite low here, though, so the wind is not flowing, you know, it's not blowing as fast. Yeah, the lioness from the western side, my side, it has moved slightly forward. But if the warthogs were downwind, then they would smell the water, uh, they would smell the lions. But at the moment, uh, there's no strong wind. They have very good sense of smell, the warthogs, but they are not in position to smell because they are downwind. The lions, the lionesses have got advantage. She's moving in first, and now you can tell because the warthog is behind this, that bush in front. Yeah, she's moving much faster now. Bo all of them are moving much faster. Okay, down. It's very normal for them to do that every time they think they've been. Oh dear, bastard, once more, they missed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it happened once more. Uh, yeah. They didn't make the right choice. They came in too fast. And the warthog outsmarted them and just ran in between them. Yes, that's what's happened, like I told you. It can be 50-50. It's never guaranteed. Everybody here is uh, on the race for survival. I hope you enjoyed that. That was hunting at its best. But the lionesses still have to, you know, find a meal. And I'm sure, yeah, they will uh, try once more. You can tell already she's uh, started on another stocking. I don't know what she's seen, but already she has started stocking. What has she seen? I don't know what she's seen. I don't know what she's seen, but already you can tell the lioness there in the middle, sorry, that one there in front, has started stocking something already. Yeah, this is quickly, this is how quickly, you know, they can get back into hunting mode and how, you know, desperate they are. I don't think they're going to get the same warthogs again because I don't think they're going to stay around here. They know 
they are on the top of the menu so you have to leave the area the warthogs that was amazing guys i hope you enjoyed that uh, for now i think the lionesses have to think about what mistake they've done but as I said, it is not guaranteed because the warthogs also are very, very smart and they don't joke around once they feel they're in the threat. They'll move out of that area as fast as possible. The lionesses are on the look already. You can tell now they're even more desperate. This is the second try they've tried to get warthog and they have missed. So they are going to start on a new hunt. I think what they're going to do is they are going to find a high ground and then you know pinpoint what they are going to go for here we have an animal that very seldom needs to find higher ground being so tall it's here bubble took down which was quite nice to see it was on the damn wall and now you're moving off into the thickets and we do have a lovely hornbull that stopped just there thank you hornbull i'm not sure it is a wingston church bull the hornbull that often tries to get our attention but i have seen a birchall starling out here that seems to have taken over from that hornbull's job oh, it's a lovely it's a red bull hornbull let me see your bull hornbull Yes, there we go. Wingston was a yellow bolt hornbull. So beautifully peaceful here at Buffalo Dam at the moment. I don't see our hippo. But nothing else to report. I'm going to go check up on Tingana. Two, one. So we are watching the last of the five. It was five lionesses in the end, just stalking off into uh, the north of Pride Lands, away from us. But what a gorgeous scene. All five of the lionesses looking s lean and hungry great condition though she's so strong and so we were commenting on how clean she looks she's heading off to see what else there is around here they were stalking a herd of buffalo but the buffaloes proved to be a little bit too formidable so they're just heading off now to see what else there is i'm sure they'll be back the buffaloes have settled at the waterhole but what a nice morning a wonderful way to spend the morning finding a pride lions i'm sure they'll be back there's water here they're just going to go and rest away from the buffaloes so that they can regroup and then maybe try again once it gets darker gorgeous last views of her as she disappears she's very far from us now probably more than 100 meters or so it's amazing that we can still see oh and there she blends you can just see her ears moving behind the quarries but i think that's the last we'll see of her until this evening Well, the lion walking away, but for me, my wildebeest are coming closer and closer to the river. Now, just wait and see where they are. And this is not the same herd I was talking about, but a totally different herd. Not sure where it came from, but it came running as you can see it. Now, they came very close to the water stopped like horses, you know, braked like a car, and then they are just now turning around and around and around, and they're like, yes, we are already here, what next? They have blown so much dust, if you see dust on your screen, it's because of those wildebeest there. Now, are these ones determined to do like the group we saw before, or are they going to stop right at the water? Let's watch. There they go. All right, we are different, not like the other lot. We can cross it, we're going through it. Mm, did you see a crocodile? Maybe yes, maybe no. See the dust they're blowing up there? Remember Ali was talking about how they churn the soil? 
with their hooves as they move. So you'd imagine thousands of these animals multiplied by four, how many hooves and the good job they do, then plus their droppings and the rain's coming, then the savanna will remain green and fertile forever. Now the group behind there is a bit serious. I think they're going to cross, let's see. Come on, push the head. Pressure, pressure. Once in a while, you see a swift fly on your screen. Some of these swifts have been known to leave uh, while flying. They'll catch some food or some dust particles in the air. This is a bigger herd than the very first one we saw because the first group was split into two. So this is a brand new group. But something tells my heart, if they're going to cross, it will be double exciting crossing than the very first one we saw. My estimate is like three, four times as big than the first group we had before. The very final decision made to cross is the trickiest for these animals. I'm sure many of them have been here before because most of them are adults. And for me, I would think they remember very well what transpired to their previous crossings. Predators, either lions in the thickest like where you see next to them, or leopards, or the reptiles in the water. It could be anything. Hyenas, maybe once in a while. But the predator that takes the biggest advantage are the lions. So flicking the tails, thinking maybe we are here, what next? And remember, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to you live from the Ma Simara. And should you have any comments or questions, you're welcome to send. Tweeting to us, hashtag CGTNWorld or hashtag WorldAf. The migration could be anything between 1.5 to 2 million animals, but the biggest number is always of the wild beasts. Not all of them will always make the cycle, which is always between the Masimara Game Reserve and the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And I think that's a population check, naturally. Omi elephants will cross the river at ease. Unlike the wildebeest, they'll come either half a drink using their trunk, scooping the water into their mouth. And once they're satisfied, they'll get in the water, maybe have a little swim, and then just cross majestically with no rush. And I've never seen them having any concern, uh, including uh, their calves as they cross the water. If anything, sometimes should crocs want to try and catch uh, one of their calves, the cows or the mothers are always very careful. But yes, they do cross the river too. Everything to me it looks right for these animals to cross the river. They look in good shape health-wise. Physically, they look fine. The temperatures are what I've always known that are favorable for them to cross the water or the river. And we also got loads of other people, just like us, coming to witness this spectacle. It's always breathtaking. People coming out all over the world. And you can see the masses of these animals building in a single file. 
heading towards the river. See them on the horizon there. And the destination is always one. Zebras, wallabies, toppies. Once in a while, we see another species that's called the eland. We haven't seen any for the last few days. And the Thompson gazelles. And they tend to tag along with the migration. So currently, what you're seeing there, we got wildebeest and zebras and topis. And I'm sure you've been following us and listening uh, to us. I'd want to ask you a question. Of all the th of those three species, which one do you think has an ease crossing the Mara River? Which one do you think will cross efficiently, seamlessly, without any concern between the wildebeest, the zebra, or the topi? Hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. Let me hear, what do you think? Anna Marie, big cats will always cross the river and we are talking of leopards, lions, and actually even cheetahs. Leopards may be in the water, of course, for feed, for feeding, they'll come fishing. Lions may want to cross uh, the river should they see, uh, for example, prey on the other side of the water, as much as they're very territorial. And cheetahs, should they need to, they'll always cross. But of the three cats, uh, leopards, lions, and cheetahs, cheetahs don't do it very well. And uh, I remember there is one very famous uh, cheetah in this area, or the other side of the river, uh, that we call Malaika, uh, who we think uh, could have lost one or two cubs while trying to cross uh, this very same uh, river, Anna Marie. I'm sure you've been following us for a long time. Uh, you know the story. Come on, Wildebeest, now the dust is settled down. We want you to make that important decision and just cross. You have no choice, you just have to do it. which is a massive number compared to the herd we had before. But I'm looking like we have more wildebeest than anything else. And this is the joy or the highlight of the migration as I keep waiting right here. And this is the buffalo herd which those lions were shadowing and as you can see it's a it's a it's a huge herd about 50 or 60 animals great yeah we'll have to we'll have to just change our position gentlemen so sorry about uh, that uh, technical hitch uh, once in a while uh, we'll get uh, those issues but our tech teams always fix them very quickly so the numbers of uh, this wildebeest are growing and growing and getting close to the river now in the water that you're seeing there where the rapids are you'll be surprised there could be so many crocodiles and definitely most of them will be waiting for these animals to cross and then do what, like we saw earlier, uh, take a chance and catch any of the small ones or any that will struggle to cross the river. Now this is the end, this is where I expect them to come through once they cross. Now you'll see two crocs there, or maybe three. Now once outside or once on the bank, chances of them catching uh, wildebeest are quite low. They do a better job when in the water because they can float, they can swim, and swim around once they catch their prey. 
it's rather difficult for them to do the same outside the water. So the one we see there, for those of you who are not with us, was from the previous crossing that was brought down uh, by a croc. They're basically out there basking and getting lots of vitamin D, which may help them with their digestion later tonight. And the important decision for these animals continues to be made. Sometimes they have small little groups among us themselves uh, to make that decision. But the way I saw them coming and running towards the river, I thought they'd just come and straight cross, but not yet. Beautiful sun now. Temperatures have gone up. And the whole idea, again, as I said, is just to be very patient. Charles, many animals will die when trying to cross the river, but luckily the cleaning crew that we got here do a very good job. If, say, the deaths are on the edge of the water, the hyenas ideally will come and eat that mess, if we'd call it mess. But if in the water we have seen vultures, for example, they're very good scavengers that easily come and eat while, you know, these animals are still in the water before they start rotting. For now, I would say, so far, so good. I've always said, the scavengers in the Mara, to me, are the most important animals of all the animal species we've got here. Imagine all these, uh, maybe what, 2%, 3% of these huts trying to cross the river and dying, and all the others that are caught by the predators out in the savannah dying, and there's nobody to clean that mess, it could be a nightmare. I'm not sure they won't take another direction or something. We're just going to wait here and see whether they come back. That movement of back and forth is very normal. They're making a U-turn or one big circle, remaining in the same place. Well, patience, and I am not going anywhere crossing fingers for another crossing. We've also got a herd milling about. We've got buffalo, the larger cousins of the wildebeest. And these buffaloes have left a small water hole and they're now moving up this slope to try and find any of the palatable green grasses that there might be. They're doing it very slowly though. Remember there were lions around and so they're being very, very careful not to move too quickly and end up bumping into more lions because of course they probably don't know where these lions have gone. So they're doing it really slowly. You've got the big males that'll be at the front of the group that'll leading the way, and then the females and the youngsters sort of in the middle towards the back, protected by some other big males. And you can see it's a beautiful view. Some green trees by those water holes and those buffaloes are making their way up this slope. There's a bit of a game path here, so you can see a lot of animals come back and forth to these water holes and they use these game paths, I'm expecting the buffaloes to do much the same. Relatively shy though in this area for some reason, the buffaloes. Perhaps because these buffaloes have moved into pride lands from areas which didn't have too much vehicle activity before. And so although they're pretty relaxed with us, sometimes especially after a little bit of lion interaction, they'll be a little bit shy. You can see those formidable horns. Charles, 
The herds of buffalo that I've seen in South Africa can vary greatly. In the Kruger Park, sometimes, especially at this time of year when water is scarce, you'll find herds of over a thousand buffalo coming down to, to drink at rivers and dams. Um, and then, you know, in the good season, they'll split up into smaller groups. And certainly in other parts of Africa, you'll find many thousands of buffaloes in big herds moving along the plains. Uh, think about the northern areas of Mozambique and the banks of the Zambezi River and the, and the Kariba Dam in Zimbabwe. But here, generally, this is about a normal-sized herd, 50 to 60 animals moving around and then, you know, rarely getting much larger if there's good food and water in the area. But Charles, this is, a, I would say, about average for most of the private game reserves and the areas of the Greater Kruger National Park, splitting up into smaller groups like this. It sort of goes in waves. When food is good, they might, they might split up. And then as food starts to become less available, they'll join up because, of course, they all need to feed on the same areas. And then when food gets very scarce, like now, they'll find the group splintering again because the, the patches of grass just aren't big enough to support huge herds. So they'll have to sort of go their own way. Think of it as a nation of buffalo with many tribes. And the tribes come together or split apart depending on certain, you know, seasons. So it's very interesting to watch. You know, I never realized that there was such a social dynamic with buffaloes, but there really is. You've got the big bulls that lead the herds and the younger bulls that all fight for hierarchy and dominance. And the females and the youngsters who make up the bulk of the herds. And I said it every single time, they're literally one of the most underrated of all the big five and all the animals in Africa. They are incredibly powerful, tenacious, resilient animals. You know, they really, really um, never go down without a fight. And the buffaloes are often the symbol of power for many tribes all over Africa. And here is another symbol of power, the leopard. Elusive, powerful, and it is Tingana. Now leopards are, like I said, very powerful. They can hoist to kills that are more than half their body weight. Up into trees. And that is, of course, as a result of competition. So you'll find in areas where there are not many hyenas. Leopards are less likely to hoist their kills and they even attempt to make bigger kills than they do in areas like this where there's lots and lots of spotted hyena. I'm so glad he hasn't moved far from where he was, just a little bit. Hopefully that means he sticks around in Juma for a little bit longer. I have noticed the last time that we had him, I think the last sighting we had of him was in Buffalzig Dam several weeks ago. And hopefully he will stick around. But there are other leopards that we do see frequently out on game drive, such as Tandy, who is a formidable huntress. And I'd love for you to learn a little bit more about her. Leopards are the more petite of the cat species, but can pack a powerful punch. In the Sabi Sands, Tandi, which means beloved, is the feline queen of the realm. Leopards are solitary creatures, known to be shy and secretive, most of the time hunting alone. A leopard's hunting technique is to either ambush or stalk its prey. They can move animals, sometimes heavier than themselves, almost effortlessly up to the safety of a tree's canopy. However, this can be a bit trickier at times. This keeps their kills from the jaws of hungry and opportunistic hyenas. Tandy is a remarkable example of a successful leopard huntress. Tandy is indeed a formidable huntress, and so is Tingana. We didn't see 
him, like I said, for the last few weeks, but the last time I did see him, he had a Stienbock kill up in quarantine. In the dead of the night, he managed to catch that Stienbock. Another formidable leopard hunter right here. Now remember, this is happening live. You're watching this leopard, Tingana, down here in the Sabi Sands of Juma Game Reserve in South Africa. While you're in your lounge or wherever you are watching this, Tingana is busy lying up under this tree. And you're watching CGTN's Digital Safari. So chat to us using that hashtag CGTN Wild or hashtag Wild Earth. Ask us your questions. Give us your comments. Let's learn a little bit more about Tingana, leopards, these trees, anything you like. And it's not just me out. We're here in several locations in Africa, up in the Masai Mara and down here in South Africa also. Tingana is rather sleepy. It's starting to warm up quite a bit, and that's when predators will be basically finding a spot to rest in. They can overheat very, very quickly. And once the sun is out, very little movement happens. Unlike you and I, they, or unlike you and I, they can't sweat. So we can, but they can. They do have some pores on their pores, P-O-R-E-S, pores, as in sweat glands on their pores. But it is not enough to cool them down. So that's why the sun is high up in the sky and he is taking it easy in a spot of shade. I actually remember that situation that Mike's talking about. Um, leopards, especially young male leopards, they do crazy things. Um, in fact, We've been tracking leopard all morning and at one stage we almost thought that we might give up which is the frustrating thing about tracking leopard. You kind of end up driving the same roads over and over again and you check all the favorite spots and sometimes they're just not there. But um, one of the trackers, they managed to find a carcass in that area where we had the tracks initially and we suspect that it might be that female leopard whose tracks we had. But at the moment, she's not there. And we know that she's got a young one or a cub somewhere nearby. And I think she is on her way to go and fetch that cub. The carcass is still f quite intact at this point. She's probably just had a little nibble here and there. And we are driving the riverbed to see if we might get lucky and maybe find her on her way there. Liz, how strong is a leopard's bite force? I don't know the exact numbers, but I know it is extremely strong. Um, some people reckon for pound for pound it is the strongest out of the big cats in Africa at least. I know that a jaguar has also got a massively powerful bite, but I'm not sure about any particular numbers put to uh, pounds per square inch or kilograms per square inch but I know it's an extremely powerful animal it can bite down on an animal as big as a fully grown male impala even a female leopard and she can drag it up a tree now we are hoping with a bit of luck we might spot some, well, maybe even her on her way to find the younger one, take it back towards the carcass. Ribbon, do I have a favorite leopard? Um, I don't think they belong to me, so it's difficult to say, I do like them all, but I have ones that I particularly like to view because I think they're quite pretty and that is actually the leopard within this particular area. And because of administrative reasons, we refer to her as the Nyala female. But it's difficult to say because sometimes you don't see her for a long time and then you see another leopard. And 
I can't really say that I specifically like this one more than the other one. Even if I did, I still don't think that the leopard would care. <laughs> Talking about leopard, there's some fresh leopard tracks here, heading back that side. I absolutely agree. We are so busy picking favorites and choosing things like that to these leopards. They're just living their best life. As you can see, Tingana is definitely living his best life here. Just taking it easy. Not a care in the world. I'm so happy to see him like this. Totally, totally relaxed. We've been so lucky we've managed gotten to spend so much time with him today. And now we even have him all to ourselves. How nice is that? Passed out. Absolutely passed out. I wonder if the females in the area have sensed his presence. So often to see, so often we used to see him and Lalamba in the same sighting. And I miss that. I miss that a lot. So half hoping that maybe she'd come along, visit dad. Tingana is Lalamba's dad. And Atandi is her mother. But at least we do have some sticks in the sighting. It's really warmed up now, so I don't, I really don't think he'll be moving too much. Although the northern boundary is not very far from us. We're about halfway up Galago shortcut. And this is usually where he comes in when he's coming into Juma from the north. Very, very sweet face. There's been a lot of talk about whether Tingana is nomadic or is he becoming nomadic. Look, he even moved his ears when we chatted about when I mentioned it. Um, I, I don't know. He's still roaming the areas that were included in his territory, if at all he no longer holds this territory. He's still roaming the area. Last time we saw him, several weeks ago, he was scent marking. So I don't think so. Tony Tail, you'd like to know if Tingana has any cubs. Yes, he does. He has uh, quite a few. Now I'm going to have to remember these. You might have to help me, but obviously it's Lalamba is one of those. Hosanna. Uh, Kachava is not his, as far as I know. Shidulu is unrelated. It is possible that Tiani in the West could also be Tingana's offspring. She's obviously no longer a cub. There was Shongila as well, that was Hasana's little mate. Hmm. I, th I think that is about it. Um, Sindile, which was Shadow's daughter, could possibly be Tingana. Oh, Tamba as well.
I'm sure I must be missing a few. Our, our leopard family tree is so extensive here in Juma. But I think those are the ones that I can that I can recall. And also being a male leopard, he would basically go around and mate with whoever is receptive and try his hardest to have as many cubs as possible. Sage, you'd like to know if the tip of a leopard's nose is sensitive. I'm sure it is, but I can't say that I have specifically read anywhere where it says it. the tip of a leopard's nose is very sensitive. But I would imagine it is, and I'm going to tell you why. Apart from the fact that the skin that's on the nose would be very similar to your house cat's. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. I'm at the river now and you cannot believe what I'm seeing. Hundreds and thousands of zebra and wildebeest, but guess what? They have a roadblock. So, are they going to go or not? Is the urge to cross more than survival? There is a crocodile on the bank. What can I say? There is a roadblock. Is the urge to survive and go across, eat the grass across, more than the will to survive. That is one massive crocodile. So we're just gonna sit here and wait. Hopefully they will, you know, come down and either come to the right of the crocodiles. I think if this happens, it's going to be one of the highest numbers we have experienced in this migration, apart from the deadly one they crossed on that, you know, flat bank on the other side. This is the norm at the crossing, milling around, looking confused, until one decides it is time to head towards the water. When that comes, it is chaos. There is pandemonium and all sorts of noises. Um, when it happens, I don't know, but I'm here. Remember, talk to me, CGTN, uh, hashtag CGTN Wild, hashtag Wild Earth is the place to talk to us. Um, questions and comments are very, very, very welcome. Yes, they are all over across there. Thank you, James. Look at them. Just a very good number. You know, remember we haven't seen a wildebeest or a zebra twice, unless we're very lucky. Yesterday I was here, previous day I was here. Every day I've been here and it's always different ones. So there's so many, so many, many, many. Look at that. Look at that. Lots of young ones, yearlings that were born earlier this year, they are making their fast, you know, migration, they are making their fast journey, they are earning experience and miles. Yeah, that could be the hindrance, the crocodile down there. I think that could be the hindrance, but they might think they're smart and then go off behind him and come down. Who am I to decide for them? I'm just going to sit here, wait, and hopefully they will come down. Mori, you ask if young ones get lost in the massive hearts. Yes, of course. You know, when you're young, sometimes you're not experienced and something diverts your attention. You look um, somewhere else or you get chased by a male or a female and then you lose, you know, one another. You lose your mom, you lose, your mom loses a young one. Yes, they do lose one another. And I think it's one of nature's way of winning or separating uh, the bond. It is uh, ruthless, but it is nature and that's how it happens. Well, you know, I'm here seated. I have to be very alert because they can decide to cross anywhere. And if they do that, I'll have to be there in a, in a very few minutes. Otherwise, we miss everything. So I have to be very alert. It doesn't mean that they're moving like that, that they will go forever. I tell you, one might stop and if 
everybody you know stops everything comes to a standstill and they turn around so it's a matter of time now because there is so much movement there is so much urge to cross it's a matter of waiting and seeing yeah it's a matter of waiting to see you know when are they going to go across but when it happens I'll be here so you won't miss a moment of it. Tigar has picked up his head, which is lovely. Of course, it shows his nose that I was going to tell you about why I thought that it was sensitive. I was going to tell you a story about Lalamba. I've seen Lalamba around a termite mound when there were lots of frogs about and then she nosed one of the frogs well first she was very curious and she was following it and sniffing it and things like that and then her nose touched the frog and she had a, quite a reaction to it she kind of just pulled back quite suddenly so i think that it is quite sensitive but as you can see they usually have quite a few injuries and scratches around the nose and that's because this whole front area is where they're eating and where they sometimes may come in contact with bits of the animal that may be sharp hooves horns etc and i can imagine that getting scratched on the nose must be quite painful oh we've got a bit of action Grooming himself with his barbed tongue. It's so barbed, you can actually use it as a comb, and he'd probably be picking up quite a lot of loose fur as he goes about doing that. Sometimes he'll even use his teeth to kind of bite if he has a bit of an itch. good guys he really does he might even have a spot of blood on his dewlap oh no you're not showing me and me so you would like to know if we can tell the health of an animal by its nose not generally in the way that you would for your pets knowing that a, a damp nose is a healthy animal because it's there's so many things to consider out here the things that you want to look for first are signs of dehydration which would result in skin that basically looks wrinkly and and is kind of kind of Welcome back guys, um, I'm still here and those are the draggers back there that you can see and they're staying still hopefully, hopefully you know there will, there will be a movement but you can tell that um, they're not doing much at the back those might be the influence they might turn back and then head back towards the crossing where they cross i don't know but i just have to wait and see um which crossing they're gonna cross remember we do have a few crossings here where i am immediately there is one which has got a roadblock of a big crocodile you know on the other side and then there is a few more these guys as you know they can decide to cross anywhere i'm hoping that doesn't happen because the view will be very limited yes that is the guy i was talking about he is the main hindrance if they decide to come here but of course i have seen them go around him and just go over and just cross another one has just appeared it looks like another very big female um, they've been eating really well these guys but still they're predators they will still go for another meal whenever it avails itself 
remember i'm on the banks of the beautiful mara river a river that cuts through the greater and the mara triangle about 80 kilometers across uh, you know ending up in lake victoria it's the source of livelihood for all these animals plus the others that are residents they need to do this almost every week once they're here during the migration as they stay here for about three months Remember, it's not always true that they cross to go to the Serengeti or they cross to come to the Mara. This river meanders along or in between Kenya and Tanzania, and so they have to crisscross for greener pastures every now and then. The movement has sort of stopped and ceased, and looks they might be having meetings, small meetings, to decide which directions they go. Remember the urge to cross? is very high and once they're here it's only a matter of time you can see a few have started you know turning to the left those might force everybody else to come they do waste a lot of time once they get here but they are wildebeest what can we say wildebeests once they're here they will go when they want to go remember to talk to us on hashtag cgt and wild hashtag wild earth questions and comments are very very welcome i hope you're having fun i hope you're enjoying this and set, sending those positive vibes my way so we can enjoy this um awaited crossing when it happens that is the green spotted land cruiser heading towards its des destination where it can um, stop and have a viewing of the crossing yes I'm loving this. The weather is nice. It's cool. It's so hot. Perfect to be out here. The you know the without any breeze, it can get very hot. But today we have both. We have a breeze, and the sun is not as hot, so it is perfect. You see those ze few zebra turning backwards. That could be the influence to turn everybody back. It just takes a few, and everybody turns around. This is the behavior while they're here. You can never predict what the next minute might bring. Marlo, thank you for your beautiful question. You ask if there's any disease that the wildebeest could carry over. Not at the moment, not of heard of recently. They do have a disease called tanning disease, and it's called it's called it's caused by a worm, a bot fly, that lays its eggs on the nose, and then um, somehow the larvae uh, makes its way up to the brain, squeezes the brain, and forces them to keep turning, turning, turning until they die. Or of course, it's not lethal to any other animal; only affects the wildebeest. But they don't have any disease that they bring. Imagine the catastrophe they would, you know, they would cause, being all of them and the distances they cover. I think would run out of animals if they were carried any disease. Look at that! It's like they are walking around and maybe making a decision as they go in circles. You know, you can wonder what goes on in their mind. You know, how much energy they lo they lose while doing this. What can we say? Yeah, as it gets hotter, chances of them crossing increase. I believe they get sunburn and decide, you know, we need to get a little bit of cooling down. Then they come down. You can tell the draggers, the tailors there, um, are still getting out of the river, but the newcomers who've gone around a big loop are coming back to the river. Yeah, I have to laugh sometimes when I see this because it's very interesting. You know, they've just been in the river right now. I don't know if they think it's another crossing or what. They've just gone through a round big loop and now they're heading back. I'm hoping eventually they will come to where I am because they're going to a crossing long ways up. They haven't, you know, reached, you know, the landing, you know, spot where they get into the water. It's still gonna take quite a while for them to go there. They're still long ways away. It's about 1,500 feet from from the water or more.
Lana, you ask if the wildebeest can choose a shallow spot to to cross. I think they might be a very smart one, or they might be lucky to choose that because they follow where they've been crossing, and if they had a choice, they would choose. So I don't think they can. They always come to the same point every year. I have seen them here for many years and so they don't choose if they did they would even use bridges we have a few so i don't think you know they would they have a, they have a choice they don't choose they just come and cross in this ancestral i'll call it crossing yeah it looks like it's slowing down i don't know Yeah, looks like more and more coming from behind. Sometimes the pressure from behind forces them to go farther. Uh, let's wait and see. Don't you worry, I'm gonna stay here. Um, if it happens, I'll share this live crossing. Yeah, it's very true, Isaac. Pressure sometimes makes the difference. And we have uh, these uh, water buds here which don't need any pressure to do anything. Not feeding currently, but just sunning themselves, pruning their feathers, making sure everything is good shape. See this small scratch they make. But it will always associate with water. And these are the cattle egrets and the sacred ibis. Some of these natural water wells or springs here in the Mara remain with water all around the year. We never see them dry. Which me, I've always thought sometimes the water table in the Mara is quite high. And we don't have any artificial water holes in the Mara. And I'm talking of, should anybody maybe think to come over sinking a borehole here in the Mara, I think we'll not go very deep. Uh, before they get the water. Look at how beautiful those egress look when they're not feeding, walking the grass with the mammals, just staying in one place. Super white, very clean. Think of all the egrets. These are like, you know, I would say spotless. And they're making sure, yes, they remain spotless. Align their feathers. The other day, I was wondering whether these birds will carry, will carry any parasites with them, and if so, which ones? And how will they have gotten into their bodies? And if so, I would want to believe they would use their beaks to get them out. The times you have seen baboons, especially the females, trying to get the parasites out of the males, and what the baboons will do will feed on those parasites, be they fleas or ticks. Not sure what these birds would do with what they would remove from their bodies using their beaks. Some nice wind is picking up now. I'm sure maybe Bunga, if you go further left, there's a little hammock up there. It's going to increase our bird, our bird count today. I'm not sure whether the in the final control has been counting how many bird species, you know, both East Africa and South Africa we have seen today, because here in one point, we have seen three species. The black duck one there is called the hammercop. You can see it's got a huge head and all of them being there for food, birds of a feather flying together, which are three different species within a radius of one meter. I'm not sure they're competing for food or like this enough for everybody. I don't want to believe this water body carries lots of food for all the birds.
Well, let me, let's have a look at the ibis again there, the sacred ibis. And you're talking, sorry, uh, of the colors. I would be surprised if they're any different. I don't know whether you mean them being a little darker, but this is the same species of sacred ibis that we got in South Africa. Maybe unless you say it's a little darker, polar bear, is that what you really mean? Or are they bigger in size? Or do you think they're much whiter? Or the black on the tail is much darker? Because, for example, polar bear, we got uh, two species of ostriches in East Africa. Here in the Maasai Mara, we got the Maasai ostrich. And further north of the equator, we got another one that is called the Somali ostrich. The males are both black and white. But if you look at the Somali ostrich, it's shiny black and shiny white. It's very iridescent. Not sure that exact, that's the point you're looking at uh, for these two uh, sacred ibis. Yeah, Paula, I would be happy to know if that's exactly uh, what you're talking about. But I'll tell you, uh, this uh, species of the sacred ibis could be the very same one that we also see in South Africa. Well, we'll be moving on. What I want to do is to chance the same lionesses uh, Isaac had that were trying to make a kill and find out if they could be doing anything. And I could be the lucky one. Uh, Isaac watched them. He wasn't lucky to see them uh, making the kill. Maybe it could be me and Bungay. Let's find out. I managed to get a nice view of Tingala. And he's now sitting up quite lovely. Lee. Still feeling a little bit lazy. He kind of gave us a ring around the Gwari bush. And it ended up very close to where we originally found him. Sometimes, depending on how animals have been with vehicles in the recent past. So maybe he was he didn't have a nice incident this morning or yesterday or something like that. He can try to avoid vehicles just because he doesn't like them very much. So that's why we're quite far away from him at the moment so that he can he can be relaxed and and will not feel threatened by us at all. It's always important to give them space. And if the animal comes closest to you, then that's very lucky for you or for us. And sometimes we can get lucky with our positioning or where we manage to find the animal. But it's always important to give the animal the freedom to move around. Chantal, you'd like to know if these predators are immune to snake bites. They are not. They have... They, they are not immune to snake bites. So, if a snake bites them, it's definitely not pleasant. And if the venom is extremely toxic, it can kill them. Now, Tingana here has been seen with a python kill twice. But pythons, as you know, do not, are not venomous. But he's managed to tackle a python to death twice. At least twice that I've seen. Which is quite something. Now, there are mammals that are immune to some extent to venom. And that comes from the fact that venom has is a very, very specific type of molecule and it kind of latches onto your cells and then is able to disable them or um, interfere with your your blood coagulating there we go gosh that word took a lot to come out your blood coagulation or whether they're messing around with um, the electric wiring in your body, whatever it is, it latches onto your cell to be able to do that. But sometimes if the, it's kind of like a lock and key system. So if the particular, the particular lock shape is a little bit off, 
then that key of the venom will not be able to attach. And animals such as squirrels, mongoose, um, honey badgers, their specific points on their cells that venom would attach to, some of them, but not all of them, some of those points are rounded or oddly shaped so that the venom cannot attach to the molecule, cannot attach, and does not affect them as badly. That does not mean that it doesn't affect them at all, because only a few of these of these structures on the outside of the cell are differently formed. But some still are, so some will be receptive to the venom. But because the entire network of cells is not receptive, they're able to recover. But they will still feel some effects, which can affect how they metabolize and things like that. And you'll often see that they might go into a deep sleep during the recovery process after they've been bitten by a snake. But for animals like these, no such defense. Okay, welcome back. Uh, rather interesting topics you are, you know, discussing metabolism, snake bites in cats. But um, for sure, I have to confess that I have seen a lion bitten by a snake. I assume it was a black mamba and it was very horrible and sad to watch this lioness, you know, go into a sort of a lapsis where it would jump and not have coordination in what to do. Do you know how to either growl or walk? You know, it was really sad. I had to leave it. And two days later, I came, it was dead. So, you know, poison for snake do affect um, cats, it does. I thought I might tell you about that because you can see on the screen and you can judge it too for, you know, for yourself. Nothing much has happened. Seems to be more and more are leaving the river. For what reason? I don't know. Maybe they want to change direction to go to a different crossing. I don't know, but I don't think they're going to go anywhere. That is what I can rely on. They're not going to go anywhere. This is just part of the behavior in a crossing. It's rather interesting and very complicated. If you try and write about the behavior of these animals in a crossing, somebody might read and then pull through the book because it will even confuse him because, you know, there is no pattern or a continuous explanation of exactly what can happen. It's stopping, baking in the sun, walking to the river, looking at the water, then going out 100 meters, stopping, deciding to go back, crossing, maybe, sometimes, you know, deciding it's not the day, then going back and spending a night. A rather very unusual and hard to and hard to understand behavior. All we have to do for us is to stay in position and hope you know it happens while we're here. I have to be very alert now because I know there is a crossing called Kaburu and it's not very far. If they leave the river and I don't see any on the, the other side, I have to rush there because that is the crossing they're going to be using. I saw a few coming my way here, so I have to be very, 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 very alert. Yeah, my crocodile um, is still there. Believe me, he's not a stuffed one. You can tell that he's peed over there and he's gone to the bathroom. Can you see that? I hope you can see that. Yeah, he's not a stuffed one. He's a real one and he's basking. And I'm sure he can hear those hoof stumps of the wildebeest and zebra. Yes, um, I think, you know, what I have to do and tell you is I'm staying here. Don't go anywhere. And we have finally managed to locate this elusive leopard. 
She's literally been walking circles all around us all morning. And then they happened to find the carcass earlier. And I think she was gone up until now to go and fetch her cub. Now we're actually quite far away at the moment because we don't want to move in too quickly. We want to give her a chance to settle down. She looks like she's in the process of maybe moving it or plucking the fur. I'm not too sure at this stage. Just look at that. How amazing is that? It's a pretty tall tree. You can see the leg of the impala dangling below her and it looks like also the head maybe. Look at the tail stretched out. And one might ask, how is she functioning at this awkward position? You can see that's why the tail stretched out. It's helping her to balance herself. And also she's got her claws anchored pretty strongly into the branch below her. And from the way that Impala is shaking, I'm thinking that she's plucking the fur. Which is something that these leopards often do. Well, I've seen with her, she plucks the fur first and then licks it for a little while, tries and soften the skin and then she'll start opening up the Impala. Just look at her, she has had a tough morning this far. Yogi, I'm sure a leopard will get hurt if it jumps off a very, very high tree. They do have an extremely strong and heavy bone structure. Because they start climbing trees from an early age, they are extremely strong. And they've also got the muscular system to back them up with that very, very strong bone structure. However, it still has a limit like all other living creatures. So I'm sure she won't risk jumping from a tree that she knows is too high. But I have watched them jump from pretty high things before. In fact, the height that she's up at the moment, I've seen a leopard jump from just a little bit lower than she is. Maybe that branch below her. Now she's looking around and she's scanning the area. It's starting to get quite hot and I think she's just arrived here, which makes me think that her younger one is somewhere nearby. Made? Yes, certainly. This is my favorite leopard for today. She is a very beautiful leopard and she is up in a tree with a dead impala. So, and after we've searched for her for a long time, we were lucky enough to get to see her. So I think it is certainly my favorite leopard for the morning. You can see, I think she is looking down on the ground. Maybe she's looking for the little one. So I think we'll move a little bit closer and see if we might get to see the other one as well. I think the sound of female leopard with some branch in the tree is picked up the ears of Tingana. Oh, can you even smell her, boy? Smell that impala. <laughs> well, now is an excellent time to have a look at his condition because he's, this is the furthest up that he sat since we've been with him. 
and you can see that mm, there is no deterioration to observe. I see nothing. His ears are a little bit more tatty, but that means very little. You can see his shoulder blades are still really prominent. He's still looking quite muscular. Yeah, it looks like he does have a bit of blood on his side there, just by his neck. There's a little bit, so he must have eaten recently. See that kind of pinkish, pinkish spot there. He looks very, very soft and cuddly, considering that he's a predator. I guess that's what happens out here. You see all of these animals, you know they're wild, you know what they can do, you've seen what they can do. But still, they're so endearing. And you can't help but use the word cute. I'm sure he doesn't. One doesn't know what it means, but if he did, I'm sure he'd say, I'm not cute, I'm tough. And sure you are, Tingana. Just wonderful to spend all this time with him. And of course, I'll be here until the end of drive. Animals remain wild all the time. I've always seen a few people trying to domesticate some wild animals. And their natural instincts do not leave them. And after like years and years with a particular animal, be it a cat, you'll always see some natural uh, behaviors in them, which becomes very tricky at times. The Masai giraffe, browsing as usual. And you look at her carefully, regardless of how nutritious the grass is close to where she is, she will not even bother eating it because giraffes are basically browsers. Small leaves and twigs that they can get. That to me looks like a keeper's bush. And I've seen them eat them a lot, which are very nutritious for them. I've browsed the area Isaac was earlier with the lionesses and didn't see any. Well, you ask me the giraffes have vocal cords. I would say yes. Let me not say yes 100%, but I would say yes, because they do communicate with the others. And for any communication, I think, to come out from any living thing, it must have a vocal cord. I would say yes. I could be wrong, but I would say more yes than no, because they do communicate. Quite inaudible. We rarely hear them, you know, communicating, because most of it is always body language. But I would say once in a while, they will communicate amongst themselves. Tall animals getting the advantage of the height. <coughs> I'm not sure what she is looking at because the area Isaac was where she, he had the lionesses, I didn't see any of them there. I'm not sure where that giraffe is looking, it's where they could be because this is the exact area where Isaac was. I'll go around that giraffe and find out if. They could be there. So we've managed to find a little bit of a better view. And we can see that she's busy eating at this point. Just have a look. You can see the lower jaw of her chewing at the back side of this impala. And that loose piece hanging here, that's actually a bone. Now, this is quite interesting because I see the fur on the impala is plucked. And then there's blood dripping from the nose. You can see the bone there and it's broken off completely. Now, this leopard has very powerful jaws and she is strong enough to break the bone. But I don't think that was her. There's also a large chunk of meat out. 
and just the sheer height that she's dragged that carcass up the tree, I think that the two hyenas nearby probably got hold of this as she managed to take it down and they probably ripped parts off and then she stole it back and took it up the tree. Maybe that's why she was not around. Maybe she was just waiting for the time. Perfect time to steal back her own meal. All you see is you see the head moving, you can see she's gripping on with the paws on the on the tree itself. Well at least the one, the other one I'm sure she's busy grabbing onto the carpet. Oh no, okay. Actually there's a paw. It's kind of looks like it's resting. Talking about an awkward position to eat. I can hear some bones crunching, you can see the fresh meat at the back. Noma, how often do leopards hunt during a day? I think it is a little bit dependent on the season and the weather itself. Like I have noticed that in the drier season when it's a little bit cooler during the daytimes, we often find that they hunt well into the late morning. But normally they are more active at night time and they do have more of an advantage after dark. But it's not unusual to see them hunt early morning. When the impala start to move, they have that eye or they have, the, when they start with their first movements of the day, maybe drinking some water or starting to feed, that's usually when their guard is down the most. And that's when the leopard decides to strike. Unajua nataka nani shadia unde hii nini? Yani tuaje iwe ipa. Sio na jeru at least ata ni vile tu mesema tunafunga. Nitaka ikonga 11 kitu. Tuwe tumeanza kupiga kushoto. Well, we got some giraffes here. And the same giraffes we were watching before. The Maasai giraffe we just turned around and now we can see a bigger number of them. Why did you stop eating giraffe? Browsing, as I was saying before. And look at the beauty of the Masai Mara. Not sure exactly what minerals they derive from the keeper's bush. But I imagine they know because not once I've seen many browsers eating the same bush and I'm also including the black rhinos are in that same category. And knowing the dangers the giraffes face, they'll always browse, get enough in the mouth, stop and look at their surroundings. Then back to eating. This has been another great morning on our safari drive, both from South Africa and East Africa. And we truly, truly want to thank all of you for your questions and for your comments. Many thanks. Remember to join us again tomorrow for another CGTN Digital Safari. On behalf of everybody, stay safe and goodbye.